Hello, everybody. Good evening, and thank you, and welcome to this meeting. Thank you for joining us for part two of Grenada, October 1983, What Really Happened. <clears throat> this meeting is organized by Grenada Ford Ever and Jem FM from Canada, a Canadian internet radio and TV station. I am your chair for this evening. Uh, we hope to have someone much more qualified. Unfortunately, they were not able to join us. My name is Kwadna Nayak. I've been involved in Grenada, Progressive Grenada issues since 1974. And my last official encounter with Grenada was my appointment by Maurice Bishop to become the trade officer for UK and Europe on behalf of Grenada and its peoples. Now, today, uh, we're going to have some suggestions as to how we conduct um, the event. So before I do that, I would like to just quickly introduce the panelists. Amongst the panelists is Alan Scott. Alan Scott is a senior trade union official located here in the United Kingdom. Alan has been involved in Grenada issues since the demise of the revolution, if not shortly before, so over 40 years. He can tell you more of, him, of himself when he's given the chance to speak. We also have joining us from Canada, John Caliste. John Caliste was involved in the issues on October the 19th and in the immediate period before, but John had been involved in progressive Grenada issues while still at school. And whilst he was also um, in the cadet corps in his school, his official um, role during the revolution was as personal security to the leadership of the revolution. He too will tell you um, his experiences. And sitting alongside me is, I'm very, very happy to introduce Comrade Selwyn Strawn, Minister of Mobilization during the period of the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada, also one of the founding members of the New Dual Movement, also one of the uh, victims badly, badly beaten up during the Geary period, um, escaped with his life barely. And of course, one of the Grenada 17, who spent 26 years in prison, wrongly accused of the murder of Maurice Bishop, so they claim. It is up to you to ask questions. They were all scheduled for execution, sorry. 14 of them were scheduled for execution, but because of a worldwide campaign, the sentences were uh, removed and they were instead sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, if I can just uh, tell you what the house rules are, they're quite simple. It's basically be polite. Please be aware that we have limited time and what's very important to all of us um, should not really um, stop other people speaking. So think of the time, something I have to learn now. No personal attacks, please. Try to be productive, try to be friendly. Yes, we can dispute and um, argue with each other, but let us be respectful to each other. And please be respectful for the speakers. Now, before I go on to an intro, I have two things to say to you. The last meeting was not as well organized as it should have been. Some of you may have noticed we had a range of technical difficulties. This meeting, we intend to really be productive, to give us an idea of what we can agree with amongst ourselves. And so we have put on our website, Grenada for Whatever Net, the following three propositions. We hope that at the end of tonight, the meeting can call upon the government of Grenada to establish a judicial inquiry to determine the facts of the events that culminated with the deaths that occurred at Fort George at the time called Fort Rupert on the 19th of October, 1983. We also hope that this meeting can support the government of Grenada in his efforts to determine the whereabouts of the remains of Maurice Bishop and those who fell with him at Fort George 
as I said, called Fort Rupert at the time. Recover those remains and return them to their families to ensure proper interment. Finally, we hope that this meeting can congratulate the government of Grenada's intention to mark as a public holiday, the 19th of October, and we call upon the government of Grenada to ensure that such an event is one that leads to reconciliation and not further division amongst Grenadians and supporters of Grenada. I have one more thing to say before I go into, if you like, the introduction to the meeting. I'm sorry about the noise that you're hearing or may be hearing. Um, I haven't yet discovered how to switch off my uh, email alerts. Hopefully I'll be able to do that whilst we are, whilst we are, so whilst we're talking. Um, just a technical thing. Um, Selwyn, Strawn and myself are sharing this screen because there is a technical difficulty that we have, which is there's phenomenal feedback if we both try and speak using separate machines. To continue, the executive of Grenada for whatever and GEM FM states the following. We believe that it is imperative that in the preamble, we should make it clear that Grenada for whatever is doing this to get to the truth of what happened during the revolution. This is why evidence is so important. We recognize and respect that there are events that raise deep emotions for many. Our aim is to assist in clarifying the history of the great achievements of the Grenada Revo and the events and causes of its collapse and to learn the lessons for the future of the people of Grenada. So we hope really that this evening, yes, we've got a range of views but let us all agree that what we want to do is to get at the truth. We in Grenada for whatever are not supportive of one side or the other. What we want is for Grenada's history to be clarified. Now, having done this, I'd just like to do a very, very brief introduction. At our meeting last Sunday, I think it's fair to say that the meeting was going off, off the rails. Um, some of you may recollect I was saying to the chair at the time, um, John Caliste, who will be joining us as a panelist, please shut the meeting down. It's, it's going very, very badly. The meeting insisted that we continue the meeting. And furthermore, the meeting insisted that the meeting should be held as soon as possible. Hence today's meeting. A number of issues were raised. A huge number of issues were raised. I think there was about four to five uh, pages from the chat. A lot of it was very critical of what uh, we were trying to do. And a lot of it was very critical of some within the former government of Grenada. We hoped to answer all of these questions. Unfortunately, when uh, Selwyn Strawn was able to join us, the meeting was very, very late, almost towards the end. Nevertheless, the meeting continued for beyond its um, expected time. And here we are today. The Grenada Revolution was a phenomenal birth of new ideas from the Caribbean. The people of Grenada, the children of kidnapped Africans and indentured Indians had been worked hard to bring wealth to others. As a result, we lived in poverty. We were released from some aspects of poverty by Eric Matthew Geary, the prime minister of Grenada, who returned to Grenada and sought about bringing about change. Unfortunately, Geary could take this only so far, but fortunately, we were lucky to have amongst our midst, members of what became known as the new dual movement, who planned and prepared for a new Grenada and when that occurred with a revolution on March 13th, 1979, these aims and objectives were achieved. They brought about a reduction in unemployment, increases in salaries, uh, benefits for women, long denied, educational opportunities, education was made free. Um, we had in the previous year to the revolution, four people going away to study at university. During the revolution, four to 500 of Grenadians went abroad to study in a variety of countries, both in the East and in the West. 
They have returned, they returned to Grenada, and Grenada is, as a result, what you see today, a prosperous, small, and still probably poor country. Unfortunately, running a revolution is not an easy thing. And in all areas of life, there are disputes. There were disputes as to the successes of the revolution during the period during the period of the revolution. And I beg your pardon, sorry, let me switch off my phone. Um, during the period of the revolution, the New Dual Movement, the leading member of the People's Revolutionary Government, sought to remedy this through discussion. Unfortunately, this was not possible. There was a dispute still extremely contentious, which led on the 19th of October to Maurice Bishop being killed, a tragedy that still reverberates down the ages in Grenada today and elsewhere, as many of you who live outside Grenada are witness to. Well, I've talked enough. I hope I've covered all the areas that the committee of the Grenada Forward Ever had asked me to do. And I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce, and he will tell you more of himself, Comrade Selwyn Strong. Um, Comrade Thank Strong. You. Thank you, Comrade Dennis. As usual, you've been very clear and precise in some of the things you've said. I appreciate the fact that the Grenada Ford ever has undertaken this very important project, an educational project, as I, I believe it is. So as to further enlighten the Grenadian people, especially those who are not around or those who are just born when the revolution collapsed. It's a long process, but I think the educational aspect of this thing is very important. I wish to apologize again for what happened a few nights ago when I was not able to join the program at the beginning because of technical difficulties. But in the end, I think we got one or two things done. And I am glad to be here with you again tonight so that we can clarify a number of issues that have been bothering you for the past decades. It is not easy for Grenadians to be involved in making up a revolution. The first English speaking revolution in the world delivered on the promises that we made when we are when we are struggling to make the revolution. Delivered in the, on the promises in a massive way, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, the entire process improved. The entire process went up in smooth. This is very difficult for people to understand, and I understand the anger that still exists among people in all parts of the third world. I do understand, and that's why I find I, I take, I try to find the time to come and respond to questions and to have to clarify the issues. Even though I've spent 26 years in prison under immense and intense physical and psychological torture. I consider myself that I've paid my dues, even though I have no legal liability for what happened eventually on the board. But I hasten to see that I have a huge moral responsibility for the death of Comrade Bishop and others. So I want to stress that point. I know I do not have a legal responsibility, but at the same time, because of my position in the revolution, because of my position in the new Jewish movement, because of my historic involvement in the politics of the country, I bear a huge moral responsibility for what occurred on October 19, 1983. I could have in fact take life easy 
came out of prison after 26 years and tried to find peace and quiet elsewhere and forget about everything. But I, I, I find it difficult to adopt that position. I cannot adopt that position because people, the people have missed something special already. And during my 26 years in, in Richmond prison, I spent in isolation, solitary confinement. I give a lot of thought to, to what would happen, a lot of thought that I said, if only we had done X, Y, Z, then Morris Bishop would have been here and we would not have been in prison today. If only we had paused for a while and reflect on where we are and how we are doing things, then our revolution would have been the beacon, the beacon in the Caribbean today because it had already developed a certain closeness with the Caribbean people through Morris Bishop and so on. And these thoughts, I reflected on them a lot. So I had, I had taken a position that I know people are angry and hostile, hostile to us because that is the nature of the propaganda. And I used to tell my comrades, while I understand the position of Ian, people are angry because one, had a special love for Morris Bishop. Two, they had a special love for the revolution because it was something unheard of in this part of the world and so on. So I believe that in due course of time, it's going to take a while. People begin, may, may begin to understand more and more why the revolution failed. And it failed because as a leadership, we collectively contributed to that. Now, fast forward to 1983. After the revolution triumphed, on March 13, 1983, we hit the ground running. There was no question about that. We started delivering the benefits to the people that we promised in our manifesto. The people were involved as they never before did in our country. They're really involved at all different levels. But one of the problems we faced was being able to deliver the goods to the people, control the situation, and tackle the external pressures which we were under. Because understand very carefully, while we are delivering massive benefits, enormous benefits to the people, the revolution was under intense pressure by foreign forces who wanted to stop the process from happening. The facts are there. At a certain stage in the process, things are beginning to get difficult, especially for the party members on the ground. So by, by 1983, the pressure was so intense that a lot of the top comrades in our party with responsibility for carrying on the programs, or, or, or as I may put it, deliberately de de developing the programmatic platform of the party, they began to have serious problems. And even though the point was made before and it was poo pooed by many people, the fact of the matter is that the pressure from the revolution, the pressure that we had to 
prepare ourselves to defend the revolution if it was attacked by, if it was attacked by external forces, cause a lot of problems with our key comrades. They begin to fall sick and so on. So they were grumbling and there were all kinds of things in, at, at, at the low level of the party. And we had to, in fact, take some steps to address the situation. There were complaints after complaints after complaints. I was getting them all the time because of my position in the party. And people were saying that, well, they tired with this, we can't make it, all kind of thing. So different members of the leadership raised the issue and we decided, look, we have to meet and try to analyze the situation very carefully to see how we can address the situation. We met as a leadership in August and briefly analyzed the complaints that were coming through. Then we postponed, we, we, we adjourned the meeting so as to have the proper assessment of the situation sometime in September. In other words, these points are very important because of the conspiracy theory, theories that are around, feeling that all of a sudden the revolution collapsed because, some, because of some poor hungry people and so on. But in August, we had a brief meeting of the leadership to assess the complaint that we were getting. And at that meeting, we took a decision that we have to meet in, in session, in long session, to analyze thoroughly where we are as a revolution and what needs to be done to save the revolution and to move forward. And that is why a meeting of the Central Committee was held in August, in, in September, 1983. And at that meeting, we spent three days analyzing the situation, three days, all of us who were in the country at the time, looking at the different problems that we've been hearing about, looking at where we are in the revolution, looking at what we have delivered and so forth. And it was agreed collectively by all and sundry, including Morris Bishop, that the revolution was in trouble. Even though that was not seen on our side, we had to, so we had to take some decision not only to save the revolution, but how we move forward. So I'm gonna analyze the situation very carefully in which everybody agreed. And I want to repeat the point. There is no dissenting voice in terms of the, the problems you are facing. So I'm gonna analyze the thing properly and so on. What, needs, what, what we have to do, we can't just get up and go. We can't just go back to the old story as one way. So as part of the preparation for the meeting, comrades were asked to come for a solution for solving the problem. What can be done? So at the end of the day, it was suggested that we come with, it was, it was proposed that we come forward with five organizational points to be implemented to move the revolution forward. The number one organizational solution was to establish joint leadership of the party so that the two leading lights in our party Comrade Bishop and Comrade Kaur would share the party responsibility. We analyzed that Morris, of course, was a man who had a link with the masses. But at the same time, Comrade Kaur was very strong in terms of strategy and tactics and organizational theory and so on. So if these are the two strengths, of if we marry these things together, we should be able to put things on a proper footing and move forward to the next stage of the process. Now, that created some problems 
because after the proposal was put forward, joint leadership, it, it, it stuck, gets stuck on joint leadership. And that was first and foremost, a problem for Morris Bishop. One of his responses to that was whether or not the proposal of joint leadership means that it was he would have more confidence in his leadership, which is the last thing in our mind. But he said he, he could not respond to it immediately. For him to respond to a, a situation like that, a position like that immediately, you need to hear what comes through that is still a matter. So that was done, in fact, that was dealt with. Kamal Kaur was invited at a meeting, to the CC meeting. I was given the task to meet with him and discuss the matter that came up. And one of the first questions Kamal Kaur had asked me was how did Kamal Bishop react to that proposal? And I told him, frankly, what was Kamal Bishop's position. He was not happy, he could not respond right away. He wanted to know how he would respond. Now, I need to, to point out at this stage, given the, the serious nature of this proposal, we decided, yeah, we decided that look, although the Central Committee can take a decision and, and implement it, given the way Comrade Bishop felt about it, we should take it to the party membership before. So the matter was taken to the party membership on the 25th of September. And it was thoroughly discussed for an entire, an entire day. And the party supported the central committee position. So when the vote took place at a general, general meeting, everybody voted for joint leadership, including Comrade Bishop and Comrade Whiteman, everybody. But it so happened that Comrade Bishop had to leave the next day for Eastern Europe. So we went to the airport with him, Kamal Kuda and myself, and maybe a few other people. He left for, for the state, for Eastern Europe. But when we come clear that after, after that, George Louis on and Nelson Whiteman decided to encourage party members on the trip who were not at the meeting to persuade Morris to go back on a joint leadership position. And that is how it happened. So when he came back to Grenada on the 8th of October, I met him at the airport. I was the only person from the Central Committee there because we did not get any information from him before as to why he was not coming back in the planned route. So I went to the airport to meet him. I spent hours there. When the plane arrived eventually, we traveled from the airport together, Morris and I. We sat in the back of his car. That's why people don't know that. And we are discussing, I, I read with him, well, how come we didn't hear from you while you're on a trip? That is not usual. The, the norm is that whenever you leave the country, you will either contact me or come, come a code to get a report as to what is happening locally and what is happening on a trip. Nothing of this sort happened. So while we drive, we're driving on our way down to his, his, the prime minister's home, and that, that day when he returned, we discussed, we reviewed the situation, and he told me there that, look, he had changed his mind about your leadership. You no longer go along with that because you need to have it rediscussed. So I said to him right there and then, I understand your position. If you want to rediscuss the matter, it is your right. You should, and I, I can undertake the task to mobilize the Central Committee for us to meet in a few days' time for you to give you a new position. I want prepared to fight him on that. The Central Committee met on the 12th of October.
and we said it is because it's but back then there were lots of things happening. But in any event, we discussed the matter and Morris put forward his position. And it was felt that listen, when 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 we come when when, when, when a meeting adjourned, we should come back and continue the discussion. But when we broke for lunch, all of a sudden we heard that there is something happening in the country. The rumor was being spread that Phyllis Cole and Bernard Cole were planning to kill one of the shop. This was something else. Everybody was shocked. What to do how to handle this thing because here it is an internal party matter had now become a national political crisis. Because once you spread a rumor to the effect that two of the top leaders in a party were planning to assassinate the prime minister, all hell would have broke loose, something else. So we had to reconvene the meeting and discuss the matter. The whole agenda of the meeting changed to something else. People wondering what, what, what are we supposed to do now? How are we going to control the situation? So we discussed the matter when we came back. And by the, by the time we came back, we got a report from the security forces that, they were, that the rumor originated from, from Kweli in the Prime Minister's house. And the security guy was definitely accusing Maurice Bishop of it. From there on, the situation went from bad to worse. Maurice Bishop was put on our arrest for the rumor on the 13th. That's one of the big errors. We have joint leadership now, so we have our service. Then by October 18th, the whole country was in uproar. Uproar. All kinds of things that were happening in different parts of the country. So by the time we came together on the 18th of October. The PRG had collapsed. All, all, all the ministers were resigned. resigned. Only one minister, two, three ministers were standing, myself, Austin Austin, and Christopher De Riggs was out of the country. So on October 18, things had gotten so bad that we formed a delegation to go to Morris Bishop to try and resolve the situation. The proposal was that, listen, we should drop, we're gonna drop grant leadership, but you have to accept responsibility for the rumor. You have to do a national address. The meeting went well. We, 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 we thought we would have resolved the issue by the next day. Because Morris agreed to, to what was proposed. Plus, he wanted to get two things agreed to. A meeting with George Lewis on, and a meeting with Lewis Whiteman. Because they were the two who encouraged him to renege on a decision when they were out in Eastern Europe. So it, was un, un, it was understandable why he wanted to meet with them. He said, yes, and right away the next morning, arrangements were made for both Eunice Whiteman and George Lewis and to meet with Maurice Bishop. But only, it only happened with George Lewis on. And the meeting never continued. And by the time it came about for the meeting to 
to resolve things and so on. The masses were in the thousands up in Montreal here. They came to free the leader. And they did so in a militant way. Even though some bullets were fired in the air. They smashed through the gate. They took my bishop and left. And I've already talked about what happened on Fukuoka. So that's the background to this, this, this whole episode. That's the background. And every time I talk about it, I feel it within me. Yeah? I have to, uh, you have to appreciate that point. Because we did not expect the revolution to implode on October 19, 1983. So I can develop on, on further points based on my outline, what I've said. I can answer for the question. And feel free to ask a question whether you're hostile or not, whether you're vexed or not, whether you're angry or not. Do not be afraid to ask your question. I will do my best to answer it. And so on. And other comrades who have some knowledge over the process can help assist in answering the question. And that's where we are. I never thought the day would come when I have to be discussing what we did in Grenada to help bring the proper standard of living to our people. I thought we would have been continued to, to, to discuss where we have reached. But unfortunately, the revolution collapsed. And I wish to point out in conclusion, And although I do not have the legal responsibility for the death of Comrade Bishop, because that cannot be justified under no circumstances at all, that would be my position for more. The death of Comrade Bishop, I know that's gonna be justified. It should not have happened. It should not have happened. But I hasten to say, and I repeat this point, that as a member of the leadership, as a senior member of the leadership, I bear huge moral responsibility for what has happened. The collapse of the revolution and the death of the prime minister in the under those circumstances. And that's what, it is. That's what I wish to say for the evening. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Selwyn. Well, um, when we were planning the second part of this event, Grenada, what happened? We were going to ask you to speak for only 15 minutes because we wanted everyone else to have the opportunity to raise their questions and their comments. But I took the decision based upon the importance of what you were saying to allow you to continue. I hope people can ask questions based upon what Selwyn has said or what they believe the situation was in Grenada. Now, we have taken the decision to mute everyone because of the size of the audience based upon last Sunday's event. I'm going to ask colleagues to, who have co-hosting facilities to unmute the members of the panel and also to unmute those who wish to ask questions, those who raise their hands using the hand symbol on the... Um, on Zoom. I'm aware that we have present as participants a number of people from across, across the globe who were closely involved in the events of Grenada during the revolution and particularly on the events which led up to and included the 19th of October. I will not say who they are. They can decide if they wish to comment or not. Just to uh, Clarify, comrade, you mentioned a number of names. I think I've got the name George Lewison, Unison Whiteman, and Chris de Riggs. I know that these were all members of the New Drill Movement and also members of the People's Revolutionary Government, mm. of which the New Drill Movement was part. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you mentioned Mount Weldale. That was the official residence of yeah. the Prime Minister? That's okay. right. Thank you. Now, 
I cannot see necessarily clearly who would have um, a question to ask. I can see many questions and many comments in the chat, but please raise your hands if you uh, have a question. Uh, Comrade Chair, there's a question on the chat. Could you read it, please? I'm <coughs> trying to do okay. things at the same time. Okay. So the question is, uh, what were the other four points coming from the Central Committee meeting, apart from the joint leadership? Okay. We had to streamline the, 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 the organization of the work. Now the joint leadership was the, main, was the main thing, but the operationalization of the joint leadership was that Morris will remain the leader of the party, prime minister and commander in chief of Grand Forces. Bernard Code will be responsible for organizational matters, as well as strategy and tactics of the party. And therefore, Comrade Bishop will continue to chair the political bureau and Bernard will chair the central committee of the party. These were the, 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 the other organizational tasks that were decided upon. The idea was that we have to examine the work program and work plan of each party member in terms of streamline, just as to streamline the work. Because here we had a situation, if we want to just give you a little background, that each party comrade had several tasks to perform every week. Whether it is in a militia, whether it is in youth work, whether it is in work education classes, whether it is Zonal and parish council, but as a PCB. Well, that we didn't, we did this, this will become impossible because each party comrade, if you are youth, then you must be in youth work. But in addition to that, you have been involved in militia. That's a separate area. In addition to that, you have to be involved in donor council and parish council meetings at the organizational level. And therefore we had to streamline these things now, which require a lot of work so that people are not overloaded with the tasks. We don't have systems overload. So the other organizational tasks were basically surrounded by party organization and what that entails. And the whole question of working on the strategy and tactics for moving forward, because that takes a special skill. And Bernard was the best person in that regard. Everybody agreed that, including Morris himself. But the fact of the matter is, there's no other party, comrade in a party, who had this, that relationship with the masses and is able to explain everything in detail to the masses. No, no other party could have done, done that, as well as Morris Bishop. No other party in the comrade had the, the natural love of the people. And therefore, the joint leadership did not affect those areas. Prime Ministership of the Revolution will continue with Morris, Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces. Some people might say that was idealism. Well, that was how we thought things might work at the time. We're genuine about it. And but it so happened that the response to it by Morris was not what was expected. And my view is that we did not pause sufficiently to understand why he was reacting to the decision like that. 
We did not look at the psychological aspect of things sufficiently. That is the truth. That is why, even though he agreed, he voted for joint leadership. He was easily persuaded by those elements. Overseas, when he went and he joined them, because they en en engage in, 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 in tell that this, this, this is just a first stage to a removal. Can you imagine that? And ironically, the only person who actually talked about Marx's removal was the same George Louis on when we were having a discussion at the, at the Central Committee level. At the same, that's the irony. But you see, the fact of the matter is, we did not give enough time, and this is self criticism now, to Marx's concern. That is why, for once, when he came back, although he was wrong to do that, he suggested that he had gone back on a decision. I tell him it cannot be done arbitrarily. You must go back to the Central Committee and raise your concern to see what can be done. And it was at that point in time, it was agreed that the matter will be taken to the general membership. And then, it was a horse of a different color. Are there further questions? Colleagues, have there, has anyone raised their hands? Um, because of what I'm trying to do here, I cannot see clearly. No. No. Can I ask uh, you, comrade, to perhaps elaborate on two or three of the most significant achievements of the revolution. These things tend to be, how shall I put it? The only thing people are talking about the revolution is its end. Now, it is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's a tragedy that it ended. It's a tragedy following the, about the death of Morris Bishop, his killing. And it is a tragedy that, that is all that we are remembering about the revolution. But there were things that we did which were brilliant. Can you illustrate a couple? And please, if you have your questions, please raise them. We are not going to block anyone from asking questions. One of the key achievements of the revolution, not the, the, the most important one, is our policy and education. The revolution. made tremendous progress in bringing education to the people in all different forms and shapes and forms. Scholarships abroad, literacy program, the economy. Now listen, let me explain this thing. We had a clear ideological position where we wanted to take the country. We were building, our, our objective was to build socialism eventually in the country. But we realized that we had to take this matter in, in strides because of the nature of the economy at the time. It was not a, a, a capitalist country as such, it was pre capitalist. We analyzed all of that before the revolution. So we had to, in fact, analyze carefully how we move forward without upsetting a number of things. So our program was based on that. Our program was based on the fact that the nature of the productive forces at the time was as such that we have to move in a particular way. So we adopted the non-capitalist path like had been, like had been happening in other countries and so on. One other thing that we analyzed very carefully that look, unlike the developed capitalist countries, we did not have a national bourgeoisie, so to speak, so that the working class was very, very, very small and weak. And that, that aspect of the, the, the process had to be developed. 
So we embarked upon a program of state enterprises, which is another key aspect of revolution. State enterprises. That should have been the rule of a national bourgeoisie. But the state had to undertake that rule because there was the absence of that. All, 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 all our business people in the country were doing was importing and selling, importing and selling. So we, built, we, we, we established state firms, we established agro-industry, we established state, uh, state tourism and so forth. By 1983, there were 44 state enterprises which we established in the country, 44. And were run along strict lines. And the revenues that came from those state enterprises went into the treasury. It's no accident that in 1981, the IMF World Bank said in its report that the recession which affected the world at that time was very serious and many other economies grew backwards. But Grenada grew by 6%. Could you imagine that in a recession? And that is not me saying that. A World Bank is not a communist organization. World Bank is not a socialist organization. It is made up of a variety of different countries. World Bank IMS, sorry. And you can look at that. So, so the state enterprises was one of the major programs of the revolution. Combined with the program for education. So much so that during the um, period of the post-invasion era, one of the biggest capitalists in the country actually said that because of the program in education promoted by the revolution, the country has been able to move forward up to today. One of the biggest capitalists in the country. Um, Comrade Chair, uh, there are a lot of questions on the chat, too many for me to read out. Could you check them and put them to I will, Elwin or anybody else that would like to answer? I will try. I've made arrangements so I can see clearly the chat and I'm going through them. But okay. first of all, I can see a Hakim Adi has raised his uh, hand. 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 But there are a number of questions that yes, were put yes, up before yes. that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but whilst Hakim asks that, I can then follow up on the questions. So Hakim? Yeah, my, my question was simply about the questions in the chat and why they're not being answered. No, okay, thank you. Can someone give me a, a, a chance by reading out one of the first questions in the chat, please, while I, I get myself together? Okay, I'll do that. Um, the, the first one that appeared on the chat um, was, uh, did Morris have reason to suspect that Bernard and Phyllis were planning to harm him? Why were they not placed under house arrest instead and Maurice protected until the rumors were properly investigated? Um, and I think there's a connected one really, um, which was um, the, why would Morris, have agreed to share power with Cord. Maurice was a popular charismatic leader, well respected at home and abroad. He also seemed to be supported by the majority of the Central Committee. Um, and connected to that again is what leadership lessons have you learned looking back 39 years later? Okay, thank you, Jean. Yeah, that's a very important question and very complicated. Now, as I said before, companies of the leadership were given the task to come up with solutions to the problem. And while there were a number of organizational tasks to be performed, and who can in fact deal with that, it was in the general view that John leadership would have been automatically put forward, but it, it, it was presented as part of the solution. Then it, it struck us 
that listen, joint leadership is not really new to the party because we are joint coordinating secretaries of the party up to the time of the revolution. Those positions were held by Boris, by Morris Bishop and Nelson Whiteman. But because of the way the revolution unfolded and because of who Boris is, it became in practice to be one leader. So given that the situation had deteriorated considerably, it was felt that that came out in discussion after it was before, right? it was felt that this might be a solution to the, to the problem. But when we had joint, joint leadership with the party, we, we were not in power. So that, that, that was a fundamental difference. And Maros was always seen, even though joint leadership existed with him and you, it was always seen as the person embodying the entire process. That's a fact. So it became clearer, it became clearer and clearer in the revolution where the masses were rallying to the, the party and so on. And Morris was the undisputed leader of the process. But we could probably still creatively apply the principle of joint leadership so as to get the work done. So as to steer the ship properly in the right direction. So to answer the question about, I do not have the, all the answers as to why Morris would think that Bernard Kuda and Smith would want to kill him. I, it, it baffled me because I was totally struck by that, that position. And I don't know if that came up before, prior to his coming back to Grenada or what. But it was totally unexpected. And the masses reacted in the way they think best they should react. Because when I, I said I came, uh, Morris and I came and traveled together from the airport when he returned. And we talked and talked about things. And I had no idea that never, that, that there was no in, indication that he would embark on that, that, that process. That is not his character. I do not know him to be that. So the fact of the matter is I, I would not be able to answer, give a full answer to that particular aspect of the question. I said, why would you think that for the school and when I could have done what, what was the basis for it? Because it was not in my thought process at all. Okay. Being close to the situation, having spoken with with Morris today, and I haven't spoken with Bernard Cole prior to him leaving the country, which was a task I had. So that's the best answer I can give as to why that occurred to, to Morris Bishop at the time. It's very sad, very sad, you know. Can I um, put uh, one of the questions from the chat? I see that Del Baptiste has uh, raised. Um, and I say to everyone, it's much better if you ask the questions rather than me read out your questions because I may have to summarize. So please raise your hands if you, if you want to verbalize your questions. Um, one of the questions is that uh, one of the participants finds it completely strange to put the prime minister under house arrest based upon the spreading of a so-called rumor. Um, this appears to be two questions. One, why was Bishop placed under house arrest, and was there a rumor? The two questions is, yes, he was placed under house arrest. Why? Because it was assessed at the time by the security forces that the rumor having been pushed in a society, Morris being asked to stay at home would have to quell it. Whereas if he's out there, he might tend to give credence to the rumor mm -hmm. and have it right or wrong. That was the analysis. Mm -hmm. and that was the rationale, the reasoning presented to me. 
And I did not disagree with the, 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 the conclusion of the security forces the manager said. I was, I was out in the field. Most of the time I was out in the field speaking to the masses. So when I got back to Bernard Cole's home that day, no, 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 not, no, no, not, not Bernard Cole's home. I went straight to a GM meeting. There was an emergency general council meeting of a party that was held to discuss the situation because by then the rumor was, was was sent out on the 12th of October. By the 13th of October, it was like wildfire throughout the country. So an emergency meeting of the general, the, the, the GM, had to be called. Mm -hmm. And I came straight from a, a meeting with the airport workers, trying to explain the situation. Please, nothing of the sort, as far as, no, as, far as I know, was in the offing, and I am. I'm upset as you are not upset, but we are trying to see how we can resolve the situation. Airport workers were, were angry. Workers, I went to work in Saint, I went to, to, to speak to people in St. George's after they heard the rumor, they were angry. So by the 13th, the next day, and things were moving very fast. Moving very, very fast. And I was informed. I'm not sure I was informed that this is the best approach. And we have uh, spoken to Morris and we have to stay home. So I tell him it's an effect that was arrest. That issue what came up in, 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 in a general meeting that evening and so on. So do you know why Morris was placed? Why what? Why was he placed under house arrest? The main reason was the rumor. Okay. And the rumor was there. What evidence did you have of the rumor? Well, Errol George. Who is Errol George? Who is the number two or the number two person in the security detail? He addressed the general meeting on that day in the presence of Morris, outlining how he got the rumor, how he came by the rumor. St. Paul's came to him. Who is St. Paul's? Peter St. Paul was Morris's chief security. And understand, this is a very crucial point, eh? at the general meeting, we had hundreds of party members. I was just spoke at a meeting, outlining in detail how he came by the rumor and the contents of the rumor, and who to, who, you know, give me a list of names as to who we should bring the rumor to, and point out that Phyllis Good and, and, and Bernard Kuro are planning to kill Morris. And he carried out the task, he, after, after he delivered the first piece of information, he, he said he, he went to he went and recruit a man to, to, to run folks, Who's Ram Folks? Ram Folks was the head of the head of personal security. The head of personal security. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of the whole of things. And you could imagine things were moving at a very fast pace. Eh? And all kinds of statements were being made and so on. Mm -hmm. So that is the evidence. Okay. And he, Errol George did not get the rumor directly from Morris, he got it directly from St. Paul, Peter St. Paul, who said that the chief wanted us to do something for him. And then everything went here right from there. Okay, thank you. Del, um, Del Baptiste, please bear with me. I'll take a couple more questions and then I'll come to you. Uh, I am now back on track, folks. Um, LJ has uh, asked, um, who are the ones who killed Morris and the others? Who are they? Uh, who gave orders? What happened to them? And that question is to a certain extent repeated by Maisie Barrett and so on. Now, Dell has also said, can you give 10 examples of the gains of the Revo that are visible today? So the first part of the question is, who were the persons who killed Morris? Well, um, let me make a point. I was not on food for two for that one. Mm -hmm. I was on food Frederick. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't have the detail. I was, I was informed initially that the unit was being dispatched to the fort to retain order. What had happened to the order on the fort? Sorry? What had happened to the fort? Was it, was it true that Fort Rupert was the army headquarters? Yeah, Fort Rupert was the army headquarters and Fort, Fort Rupert was overrun by the masses, angry people. And when they got their arms were being distributed to them from the armory. So the people had to, the food had to be retaken and, and, and out of the store. So the army high command and the person who had the legal authority to dispatch the unit took the decision to send the army to restore order. But in the process of so doing, the people who were already there decided to fire upon the people and they killed some of the soldiers who were approaching the fort. And that led to all kind of craziness, all kind of madness. Because the information coming out of Fort Rupert was very inconsistent on that day. Some people thought that the, 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 the bishop died in Prosper. That was that initial line that came out. But then it was clear subsequently, as I learned later on the night, that that did not happen there. Even though the shooting took place while Bishop was in the ops room, and then we escorted to another part of the fort where the claim actually took place. But as for me, the details were always hazy. And I want to say, make the point that I cannot, in fact, give it all the details that took place there. It was any confidence because I thought this Noel was also killed on top of the fort, but I learned subsequently that he died somewhere else. Vincent Noel was a founder of the New Jewel Movement and a member of the People's Revolutionary Government. Yeah, he was a member of the PRV. Supporter of uh, Morris Bishop. Yeah. Okay. So I, what I would, like, I, I would like to help with that, but I cannot in fact give, up to today, give all the clarity with the, the different thing that happened on Fort Rupert. Okay, can I, can I say this? Um, It is very difficult to understand how the names of the actual soldiers who killed Morris, whether they were given orders or not, is not known. Um, because I have seen a film in which a number of soldiers were interviewed and in which one soldier has indicated clearly that he did kill Morris Bishop. That soldier, I believe along with three others, were the ones responsible. I, I genuinely don't have their names to hand. There may be people in the meeting who have, but I know that these soldiers are alive and living in Grenada, are living openly in Grenada. So that's information that I think we need to supply to this meeting. Now the question then is, who, if anyone gave orders to kill Morris Bishop. Um, it seems from all of the information that we had, the soldiers that entered Fort Rupert to retake it claimed, well not claimed, it's actually a fact, that four of their comrades were immediately killed by gunfire from Fort Rupert. And as a result, they were enraged by what had happened. Now, again, that is, could be speculation, but it is a fact that the first people who were killed on October the 19th were four soldiers. I think we need to tell the meeting who 
the soldiers were who killed Horace Bishop, um, I think it's probably untenable not to do so. Um, but I've talked enough. Um, Del Baptiste, um, please unmute yourself uh, and speak. But before you do, just quickly, we have got, um, yes, Alan, I see your hand raised. Um, I ask if you could unmute yourself and after Del, because you may have some, some answers. And also, uh, John Calise, you were closely involved and you were on one of the forts in Grenada. I don't know if you were able to answer some of these questions. Um, Del, go ahead, please. All right, hello, good afternoon. So I kind of have a four, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so I kind of have a four part question. Um, you spoke about the pressures of, on the leadership. And by that, I assume that you mean not only at the PB and CC level. Could you explain, but, um, Could you explain these terms? Uh, political Bureau and Central Committee level, but further down the, the leadership chain. And, and I can agree with that to uh, a certain extent because I, I had a state job, I had militia duties, I served on the PCB and, I, and you forgot the POT which was another organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you, could you please explain these uh, alphabet soup of, uh, of acronyms? So the, the, the PCB was the Parish Coordinating Committee um, body. Body, body. And the POT was the Parish Organizing Team. Yeah. The, the POT focused a lot more on youth work, youth and student work, while the PCB focused more on the um on the sort of areas that affected the day-to-day -day running of the parish issues of the economy yeah yeah so but in 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 so many cases so many of us had dual roles on this organization and i still had to volunteer for cpe to teach in cpe and work at education classes so i i understand all that but um i didn't feel overworked maybe because i was 19 years old i don't know um, and at that stage, you have all the energy. Um, but let me ask this question. Given what we know about lead what I know about leadership now and what we have subsequently learned, is that even in the best situation where you have very good, strong leadership, you have ebbs and flow. So the revolution was going through one of the, 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 the low points, so to speak, where enough was not getting done. A lot of comrades had gone overseas to study and all that had happened. What, what, what our lack of sort of experience in senior management, because many of us had, who, who now had enormous responsibility had never run anything in our lives before. And we, did not, for us, it was go, 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 get this done now, get it done yesterday, all right? We did not understand that sometimes things will drop, you know, um, you, you, you have some missed opportunities. And how much our failure to understand that in the, in the, great, in the larger management structure contributed to that additional mental pressure that was put on the leadership to the extent where we felt that we needed to sort of reorganize the, um, the hierarchy of the party. Um, so that's one. The other question I want to, to, to something I wanted to talk about is that I, I, the more and more I think about the joint leadership, because when it first came up, I thought it was a great idea. And I, I still today have mixed feelings about it. But to me, when I listened to you earlier on, you, you, you mentioned the Political Bureau and the Central Committee, but you did not mention the OC, which was a critical, critical arm um, of the party. And for folks like me who was on the ground every single day, we were more sort of fearful or more in tune to what the OC was doing because that's where all the organization and all the structure and strategies was coming from. And the OC was chaired by Bernard until his um, resignation from the party. So in a sense, 
didn't the party already have joint leadership? I'm, and, and I'm talking post-revolution because we know pre-revolution, we had the coordinating um, 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 secretaries. And, yeah. and thirdly, can I, you, can I say, yeah. <laughs> please bear in mind the, uh, the, the rules. Last, last one, this one is important. Be, be this one brief. is important. Uh, everything is important, but please yeah. be brief. <laughs> okay, so I'll be brief on this one. What, what role, George Louison turns out to be a pivotal figure in this thing. And so I know they were, they, they were planned to create a, a, a new ministry. And Sally, you'll probably be able to speak to that a little better, called the Ministry of State Enterprises. And the, the, the feeling was that George was unhappy in being the Minister of Agriculture and had wanted that portfolio. And when he, he, he sided sort of with the idea of joint leadership that would bring Bernard back into the party because he felt that if he did that, that in the selection process of who that new minister was going to be, um, that Bernard was going to be instrumental in it, that he would have a, a better chance of get, getting that portfolio. And that when he found out that Bernard felt that the best person for that portfolio was Lydon Ramdani, then he switched his position back to Morris. How much of that personal failing as, as a human, and we all have it, I have it, you have it, other people have it. How much of that personal failing led to George switching position and in a sense being involved uh, um, in, in, in sort of, speeding up, I have no other way of putting it, speeding up the demise of, of, of the revolution. Okay, thank I'm you. Impressed, I'm impressed, I'm impressed, man, you. Thank you, before, before we uh, answer those questions, um, and before I come to Alan, um, a number of people have said what evidence there was to suggest that Morris was the originator of the rumor. Um, how can the evidence of one man, Errol George, result in Morris being placed under arrest? I think it is, fairly in, indisputable that this is a fact, that mm -hmm. the rumor was started by Morris. It was um, given to the head of security, personal security, by Errol George, and was confirmed by uh, Cletus St. Paul, the head of um, Morris Bishop security. And Morris Bishop himself confirmed it mm -hmm. at a meeting in front of several members of the mutual movement. Is, is that correct? Well, he confirmed it by not addressing it. Okay, so he didn't deny it. No, but, 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 but listen, no, no, one quick point. No, 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 I'm sorry. It is important to address the Roma issue. Until we answer your first set of questions, then we'll go to Alan Scott. And then if you wish to come back, please. Otherwise, we, you know, why should I chair? Um, and there's another person aside from Alan Scott who has raised their hands. So please answer Dell's questions, which I've given to you. And Dell will come back to you. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm impressed with some of the points. You read, you read some very important points, and you. You speak like a member of the leadership, man. But the point, the point you're making is that um, the pressures on the leadership were real. And the question of lack of experience of the leadership. Um, yeah, I'm coming to that. The, the question of um, the experience of the leadership was something that we saw in retrospect. And that's a very powerful point. That lack of experience, in fact, causes not to take a deeper look at the solutions to the crisis. Because had we done that, we would have paused and said, listen, while the situation is 
x. We cannot, in fact, do that because of y. Or we should not have done that because of y. We were enthusiastic. We were young. That's a very important element to recognize. We were young. The youngest person in the revolution was not even 40 quite yet. Morris was just around approaching the mid-30s, and I was even younger than that. And our, our sort of leadership was even younger than us. So we, we were in fact undertaking a task of enormous significance worldwide. Remember I said, this was the first revolution in the English speaking world. Under pressures from imperialism, and all of that. How do we handle them certain circumstances? We were not, while we were, were, were developing ourselves, we were not clear on all the, the, the way forward. And therefore the psychological aspect was not there. If we had that psychological grounding, from the moment Morris reacted that way, we would have taken stock, we would have paused. So that was a problem for us. The lack of experience because of our youthful nature and so on. The role of George Louis on is critical. You read a very important point there because the economy was moving in a particular direction and we had to streamline the organization. We had to bring everything under one, one ministry. And we discussed that at the level of leadership that a ministry of state enterprises should be established. It is clear that George Lewis had ambition. He thought he would have, that, that he wanted to, to lobby for that because this was another new ministry we were putting forward. And it was an economic ministry which would have been dealing with the heart of the economy and so on. And he did in fact make certain moves. He felt that if he tried to get Morris to the neck on that, it will, it will have certain consequences because it would mean that Bernard would be out of the scene and therefore that would play the path and to get his job that he wants and so on. So you, 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 are, you are correct in, the, in that. There was an element of that under the part. Taking aside of the joint leadership issue, when it suits him, and switching when it doesn't suit him. And that ha all had to do with his own personal ambition. I don't want to talk about that because I think I, I like to. I like to, 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 to avoid these issues, of it, but now that you raise it, I can, I can see with, 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 with confidence that it can be so. And let me give you a concrete point now as to John Lewis and behavior, quite apart from what he did in Eastern Europe. When he came back and so on, he immediately set up a task to do a number of things. But when he came to the um, the first central committee meeting where Morris was supposed to explain the reason why he reneged on the decision. By then we had a number of reports from drug groups on what he was doing, even in Cuba. So based on the evidence that we had, we had to take the decision to expel him from the central committee. And Morris did not defend him. Interestingly, in that meeting, that was the first meeting of the Central Committee after Morris's return. And when I, in fact, suggested to the committee that we need to organize another Central Committee meeting so as to hear Morris's position on we stand. So after we discussed the drug Louisan rule, we had no choice but to. to to take the decision to expel him from the central committee, not a party. 
And the term that we use it was based on is opportunism. Opportunism, which fits in with the point you're making. And by the time the meeting of the general membership was called in Butler House, after the rumor spread, we discussed it and so on. I remember I, speak at, I spoke at that meeting, I was very passionate because I just come from a meeting and I said with the airport workers. And Errol George, in fact, exposed the rumor there. You can make no mistake about it, the rumor was critical. Critical. Because here it is, the, the, the internal problem we are having came out of the, the party via the rumor and everything went haywire. When that meeting recessed that night, bear in mind that the 13th of the 13th of October, six days away from, from October 19th. Jordosa was at a meeting because he's still a member, even though they're expelled. But the interesting thing about what Jordosa did, in keeping with your point about his conduct, and I made this one before, I'm not making it for the first time, but I made it internally. George Louis John came up to me and Bernard Code while we were recessing. He came up to me and said this, I always know that Morris never believed in joint leadership, in our collective leadership. That's what he said to us. He did and gone now, so I, I, I hate to make the point, but I made it before, before he passed on. But that is consistent with the point you're making about him, and that is true. But he did that. That was his last deed. At that meeting where the rumor had been discussed, and certain decisions were taken, Morris was already under house arrest because he came to the meeting while he was under house arrest. George Louison, during that recess, came up to Bernard Kuda and myself and made that point to us. Lots of people don't know that. But that's the situation. That's the kind of person we've been dealing with. Okay. Who was abroad trying to show Murray that this is just it for the first stage, the first phase. Ultimately, you're going to be moving on, on you because of this thing and so on. That's that that's that, 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 that goes on. Okay. And Morris, of course, you know the kind of person he is, you keep listening to Tom Dick and Harry all the time. And he decided to take the decision to go back on the vote that he cast on the 25th of September, 1983. All these little details are so important, but I, I don't talk about anything. I can talk about other things, but it's important. Okay. Very important. Um, thank you very much. Um, just going on to Alan. Alan, if you're still uh, there, and uh, if you can un unmute yourself. Thank you. I have. Um, can I say, first of all, that we've, we've been, I did mention at the last meeting about Alan, could how... You, sorry, could you explain who you are? Sorry, um, I'm Alan Scott. Um, for a long time I was involved in the Committee for Human Rights in Grenada, and I originally got involved in the campaign because I was on a trade union delegation that attended part of the appeal hearings, mainly because a lot of concern was being expressed about a, how it's being conducted, and frankly, the condition in which the prisoners were being kept, more or less on starvation um, conditions. Um, at the time I first attended, first went across, um, other than the fact that I'd heard of Morris Bishop and I'd heard of the fact that the Americans had invaded Grenada subsequently, um, I knew absolutely nothing about it. So I went into a situation not knowing the characters involved, not knowing the arguments, um, not really knowing what had happened. And so I'd spent a lot of time reading documents, talking to a lot of people that were involved, frequently being given information by Grenadians who were too frightened to admit certain things. Um, even now, 
Uh, one person has recently said he can tell us who started the firing on the fort, but he didn't tell us the name. Um, that sort of fear factor is still there. So I sort of started getting involved in looking at what had happened, looking at the documents, and eventually reached a conclusion that the there is absolutely no evidence given at the trial that would have convicted um, any of the Central Committee members in any proper court. Uh, and I say that because the A, the main evidence about the conspiracy is from an individual who actually wasn't there. Um, he was actually at another part of Grenada at the time. Um, secondly, evidence that was given around the, the great uh, attempted takeover by Bernard Cord, arguing that he chaired the a central committee meeting that actually discussed the joint leadership. A, Bernard Cord wasn't there, and Bernard hadn't actually been a member of the central committee for about a year because he'd resigned. And secondly, the person giving the evidence, Mr. Lewison, wasn't even in the country at that stage. Um, so I, I reached a conclusion that, in fact, whatever else had happened, um, that there hadn't been a free and fair trial of these individuals and started locking into the to information further and talking to people. The minutes of the Central Committee meetings were taken by the invading forces and were denied the defence. Um, so although minutes were, minutes were actually available, they were actually taken off the island. Uh, and it's very easy to see why, because the picture that the US were actually portraying about this leadership bid there was no crisis into the, in the Central Committee, et cetera. You've only got to read the, the, the minutes uh, that show that this is a complete fabrication. Um, people have been trying to put those into an electronic condition this afternoon and will be available for people, if not tonight, very, very quickly. So you can actually read those documents and reach your own conclusion. Um, they very clearly show that there was a crisis uh, and there had been a series of problems over a period of time which hadn't been addressed. Um, Comrade Baptiste may well be right. Um, a lot of people perhaps not with the experience to deal with um, certain issues, um, looking inward rather than outward. But the reality is that A, there was no dispute about the, the fact that the revolution was in crisis. I think there was perhaps a dispute around the solution of the joint leadership and it was clear that I think at first Morris was uncomfortable with it but it's also very very clear that this was put to a whole party meeting that unanimous, unanimously supported the proposition of the joint leadership the day after it was put to the cadet members again who voted unanimously in favour of it um, so I don't think there's any dispute that what, what that, that a pro proposition was put and looked at in a very democratic way. It was debated and a solution was agreed. Uh, it is also the case that when Maurice Bishop returned from Eastern Europe, he clearly changed his mind. To clarify something Selwyn said, because people were asking, well, why was Maurice put under house arrest? Errol George and Cletus St. Paul, who were part of Morris's personal security, indicated that they were asked to spread the rumour by Morris Bishop. And in fact, Errol George said this at the preliminary hearing. Uh, we have a very, very detailed sworn affidavit from him uh, to that effect. Um, he actually made these points in front of Morris Bishop at a meeting at Butler House and was not contradicted by Morris Bishop. So if you're actually asking the question why, was Morris put under house arrest around the rumour was because those that had been some of those individuals who participated in spreading it actually admitted that Morris Bishop had asked them to spread it. Um, thirdly, a point that this hasn't been made um, around the issue of the Central Committee, um, there was in fact a further meeting of the party uh, at which um, several of the Central Committee members, including um, Chalky Bento, and Bogo persuaded um, a not very happy group of members to agree to withdraw the central committee proposition, that, sorry, the joint leadership proposition. So and that, that had actually been communicated to Morris. 
So realizing perhaps too late um, that this situation was causing a major difficulty, um, the decision was actually made uh, and looking at the notes, party membership, not very happy that one person thought he was above the party and could tell everybody else what to do, but did recognize the fact that to actually, in the interest of furthering the revolution, that they would draw the proposition. And finally, on the issue of the execution, um, the, four sol the soldiers have always made it very clear that they had no instruction from anybody, um, that there was a, an angry reaction to hearing that Conrad Mayers was one of the soldiers um, that were shot at from the, as they were approaching the fort and killed. There were four soldiers on the front armoured carrier died that day. Although strangely, in the stuff that gets printed in Grenada, they are never get mentioned. Um, they were they were killed from fire from the fort because the, the civilians had been armed. Um, totally lost their temper, lined people up and shot them. And they've been on record, and um, Callistus, who led the foreign squad, has been on record on a number of occasions, making very, very clear he was under no instruction. And one of the things that happened after the fort had been retaken is two of the soldiers on the fort, uh, Cecil Prime and Lester Redhead, got into a jeep and went back to Fort Frederick to actually tell people that the fort had been retaken. And the reason they had to do that was because the telephone system had been cut off um, prior to uh, Bishop actually entering the fort. So there was no telephone communication between Fort Frederick and Fort Rupert. So there couldn't have been somebody ringing up saying, oh, we've done so-and-so, and someone saying, oh, shoot them. Reality is, that it, I know people like the conspiracy theory, but the soldiers have made very, very clear uh, in a rage, uh, having seen their comrades died, they reacted in a particular way. Don't just defy it, don't defend it, but that is what happens. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. But before we get on to Deborah, um, just to take some of the comments. Um, someone, Chris, had suggested that it may not have been a good idea to name anyone in particular as, as being the people who killed Morris Bishop, but I think it's in the public domain. It's on a film. Um, uh, the people are there and have been in prison for more than 26 years and have now been out for in excess of 10 years and living amongst the people of Grenada. Um, LJ, I think this is directed to you, says, uh, please thank Mr. Hansom for sharing his experience. Um, with us again, I understand it must be difficult for him to rehash it and uh, fully appreciate the knowledge. And so thank you uh, very much, uh, LJ, on your behalf. Um, I'll thank LJ. I don't know, maybe a friend of yours, uh, probably not an enemy. Um, and uh, now we go to Deborah. Uh, Deborah, if you could please unmute yourself and lower yes. your head. Yeah, mine is more of a comment than a question. Um, this, I think the whole issue of this uh, rumour is a smokescreen. Um, it, putting a prime minister under house arrest is a hostile act. Um, and it would have been um, anticipated by those who did that, that the people who, who, the people who so loved Morris would have risen up and tried to uh, support him and protect him. And so all the conditions were put in place. And actually this is, I've said it before, this was a nasty, uh, grubby uh, attempt at a power grab. And, um, you know, they deprived those who were involved. The army did not act unilaterally. They acted on the... Uh, Sorry, should I continue or? Yes, please, sorry. Yeah, sorry, they acted, I believe, uh, with the complicity of some of those who work with Morris on the Central Committee. And, um, you know, they what they did was deprive Grenada of a great leader and the gains that would have been achieved if the revolution um, had continued. And, um, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it, that when you've been involved in something as murderous as that um, and all the implications um, nationally and internationally and you spent time in prison and there may be guilt and there may be all sorts of feelings and people are demanding answers and you try 
to rationalize what's happened. But a lot of this just does not make sense. I'm not speaking as somebody, okay, I wasn't in Grenada at the time. My parents are from Grenada. Uh, my mother um, knew Morris Bishop very well, and um, his family were connected to my family. And even when I went to Grenada in 2018, I spoke to um, staff at a hotel who were um, the security, secu members of the Morris's security. And they said at least a year or two leading up to what happened, that they were warning Prime Minister Bishop that there were um, a, that there were going to be attempts to remove him and to kill him. So this whole idea that he was put under house arrest for some so-called rumour and all the other things that have been said, it just doesn't, doesn't hold water, doesn't ring true. So that's my contribution. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, at the start of this meeting, we said we are calling for evidence where people make statements. Uh, do you have any written evidence? Are you able to give the names of the people you spoke to at the hotel? Well, I mean, um, you're, you're, no, no, you're saying... No, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. Are you, you, asked, you speaking to me? Name? Yes. Have you got yeah, let, me, look, let me just respond. You know, you're saying about, about evidence. You know, we are, some of us are ordinary people. We've got family who, in, as I said, who are Grenada, from Grenada. Um, we've heard personal testimony from people. That is evidence. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not um, somebody who's um, intimately been involved, but having heard, as I said, personal testimony from people and knowing people that are very close to the situation, you know, I think it's good to hear these testimonies. I'm not, I haven't got written evidence, but, you know, a lot of those letters and documents and so on have been destroyed anyway from the guilty parties. So, you know, I've read books. As I said, I've heard personal te testimony. I'm giving you my, um, my opinion based on, on, on what I've said and where I've heard it from. Thank you very much, Deborah. I'm glad you clarified it's your personal opinion based upon what you've heard, which in legalese would be called hearsay. What do you have to say to Deborah's? Well, uh, I said from personal testimony of some people that were close <laughs> to the situation, it's, but <laughs> that's, just, that's not hearsay. No, you no, know, you, some you of are... the evidence that, you're, that other no. people have presented, I mean, Selwyn has given his verbal account of what's happened. Yes. People have questioned the uh, truth of that in the uh, chat and on, on camera. Um, he's not presenting us with any documents or anything at this time. This is his, his account of what's happened. And some of that might be verified by other people who are involved. But, you know, we could say some of what he's, he's, say, he's saying is not based on truth. There are hundreds of documents, some of which we've placed on the website. These documents were sworn under oath, albeit in an American controlled court. People have given evidence to the Privy Council, of which Grenada is a member. Um, Selwyn is giving his own personal eyewitness evidence. You are giving the statement of others. Now, we can argue about this point of law and so on, but what do you have to say about this? Um, well, it's yeah, very sad. It's very sad, and I understand the passion of it. What's her name? Deborah speaking. De Deborah. But as I said in the past, and I will continue to say, I am not speaking out. Somebody had to tell me I am speaking as an insider. I was one of the leaders of the revolution. I have intimate knowledge of all that went on, and so forth. So when I speak, I speak with authority. And this is not a denounce government. She has no authority to say what she's saying, but others should say it passionately. She's mad, like many other people. She's vexed. She's hostile. And that is her right to be hostile. Mm -hmm. But as I said before, I do not have to be doing this. I've paid my dues, and nobody could question that. Spending 26 years in prison under the most intense physical and psychological torture is not an easy thing. You cannot talk about that. We fought to our case and we get our freedom eventually with the help of international support and so on, including this organization that is 
organizing this matter tonight. A correction, Committee for Human Rights in Grenada. Yes, yes, Jardy. Yes. Committee for this, this is an outgrowth. This is an outgrowth of, of, of this, the CHRD. So I understand our position. I, I wouldn't get mad with her for that. I would not be upset with her. Although what she's saying is not true. I know it's not true because she's not the insider. I am. And she cannot question that. Nobody can question that. And I didn't want to come here and, and expose myself to that. But I chose to do so because I feel, I know the people felt, I know they have been subjected to intense brainwashing over the years, intense brainwashing, which they use as, as facts. But we can talk. And I'm really, like many people, upset that the revolution has been overthrown. It should not have been the case. Maurice Bishop should have been alive today. We should not have spent 26 years in prison. What is the point? So, maybe one day, Deborah may get to understand the real situation. Maris and I have been very, very close, very, very close. And I have, <laughs> Maris and I are very, very close, I see, you know. Very. And if you think I can, I can take a decision to kill him. Well, you gotta be mad. You think I can, can I take a decision to kill him? No, that could never happen in my in me. Okay, um, Del, so, I haven't, sorry, sorry. So I just wanna make the point that you said what you had to say, but you have no authority for saying so. You have no authority, no basis for what you're saying. I am saying what I say because I have the authority. I am an insider. I know what happened. Galatians 6 and yeah. 2. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Del, I'm going to come to you, but before you, well, it was Noreen. Um, <laughs> Del, if you don't wish to uh, contribute anymore, please let me know. Noreen, could you please unmute it? I think you've unmuted yourself. Could you speak, please? Um, okay. Could you keep it brief, please? Just four points I'd like to make, and hopefully. Brief, I'll... please. I hope so. Um, I had read that um, when George Lewison came back from um, from the Eastern European trip, that he it was that there are reports, and I believe written reports as well, to say that um, he began to tell people up and down the country that Fidel Castro was behind Morris Bishop and the masses. That was on the ninth, the day after returning. That's one point. Um, um, on the 12th, when Morris um, uh, told uh, the Central Committee and the general mem members that he, had he, he no longer wanted to accept the position of joint leadership, um, am I right in thinking that um, Cletus St. Paul, on the day of the, when the rumour was spread that same day, that he, um, the, there was a written confession and a taped request um, a tape recorded confession taken from him. In addition to that, am I right in thinking that um, there was a raid on, I believe it was St. Mark's Armory. Um, St. Paul's, or, St. Paul's. Or St. Paul's, um, yeah, um, Armory, um, where the militia kept um, arms and so on. There was an attempted raid there, reportedly also by George Lewis. And, um, in addition to that, um, in addition to that, am I right in thinking that the day that um, that same evening when um, Morris Bishop, it was advised to that it would be best for him 
to um, be detained until and stay at home until this rumour was fully investigated, which I'm sure that would be something that would be done in this country or any other country, um, as it was done in um, after, you know, with Trump and, and um, the um, when people tried to take over the um, uh, um, Washington, D.C. But am I, um, in addition to that, am I also... Um, is it also true that Bernard was advised to stay at home because of the potential risks to him? And um, am I right in thinking that Bernard resigned totally um, from his positions in government on the 14th, um, just two days later, and had plans to leave the country because of the vicious rumours? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Did Cletus and Paul give a written and taped confession, as far as you know? Yeah. In respect of the rumor. Can you say? When Cletus and Paul came into the Central Committee meeting the night of October the 12th, and he was questioned by the rumor, he denied it. He denied it that he knew not know that blah 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 and so on. But uh, John had already given his evidence and so on. So Peter and Paul was was arrested as a result. And while he was on, under arrest, he wrote a letter to the Central Committee blaming Morris now. I read that letter, I read it in a, in other words, that other, the, the Yankees probably had that letter somewhere. I don't want to show it. But he wrote a letter blaming Morris for spreading the rumor. He swung. And I'm not asking, I'm not saying that somebody told me that, you know. The letter was read by me and others, and so on, in the height, in the height of the rumor and things on. So when, when he was in, you realize that the situation had gotten serious. So he decided to swing on Morris while he was under detention. Regarding I don't know where that letter is, but I, I'm telling you, I, I saw it. Regarding the raid on St. Paul's Armory, which is a fact that there was an attempted raid on St. Paul's Armory, um, Noreen has asked, was this raid led by George Lewis or did he participate as far as you know? The St. Paul's Militia Armory. There was apparently... I don't, have, I don't have that fact. Okay. Um, Noreen has said uh, Bernard was advised to remain in his dwellings, which was also on Mount Welldale, opposite Prime Minister Morris yeah. Bishop, for his security. What do you have to say about that? Well, I, that, was, that was also done. But the advantage that Bernard had is that we were meeting in his place to coordinate the situation as it was unfolding. So it did not have the same effect as the point I'm making when mm -hmm. he was advised to stay at home too, mm -hmm. and so on. Because his name, his name was, if it, in any event, if Bernard went out, he would have been lynched by the people. Anybody here caught a glimpse of him. But the fact of the matter is, which is the truth. But he was also asked to stay home. It did not have the same effect as Morris's also rest. Because once people hear Morris, they know Morris was responsible for the rumor. And um, you mean once they heard he was under house arrest? Sorry? You mean once they heard he was under house arrest? The, the people? Yes. Yeah, that's all they had to hear, you know. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. They can't talk to them. I I I I experienced that first time, you know. As I said before. On the 18th of October, things had reached a stage. When I completed the meeting, I had with Lydon Ramdani at my office. And Lydon Ramdani, we got a number of points. Lydon Ramdani even told me that he was a socialist capitalist, and I never heard that term before. Lydon Ramdani was a major, is, was and is a major businessman in Grenada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he told me that in our discussion, because a lot of ideological points were being made in the whole process. Mm -hmm. Who is on the side? Who is on the side? But Lydon Ramdani uh, sitting opposite me, you know, he talking about this whole thing. And he, he pointed out that 
Bernard has been a good man to him. He done a lot of things in the ministry and so on. He never told me then that he was resigning you know, from the party. But I met, we met up to uh, around five o'clock, uh, a little after five. On when? On the 18th of October, the 18th. Lightning Ram Danny just took it out. He went and saw all kinds of things afterwards, you know. And I was trying to point out to him that we had to resolve the situation. We cannot allow him to go. So along the way, he told me that he's a socialist capitalist. I never understand the meaning of that up and out. But he left. And as soon as Ramdani left, I was given a, a call was given to me, pointing point out to me that some people were waiting on me down in the drill yard. So, I, so people organized a meeting for me to go to, and I don't even know. And by the way, while I was meeting with Lionel Ramdani, I spoke to Norris Bain, you know. Norris Bain promised to come down to have a meeting with me the next day, the October 19th, you know. I expect you know, I was being in my office around, because you had more talk, more you come out there. Eh? Because I was trying to see what can, apart from meeting with people all over the place, because I'm the national mobilization, people, and all kind of things. So- Nor Norris Bain was one of those killed on the 19th, yeah, along with Morris. Yeah, I was going So while I waited for Mar Norris Bain, he probably went to the market square and then joined let me Marcus go and join my bishop on a food because he heard he was up there. Very sad story to you. Very sad story. So, <laughs> so the, the, the thing is that um, I was about to say that I've been facing the matter. I went down to the drill yard. By the time, after two minutes I got there, the place was jam-packed. I don't know where the people came from and they were in a hostile mood. You know, they were not hostile to me personally, I must admit, but they hostile nonetheless, especially Bernard Ford, hostile to him. But I came not to address them and to explain to them the situation. And I was determined to do that. So I found myself in the middle of the crowd, the middle of the hostile crowd. I could have been killed, but it was a risk that I had to take. I could have been killed. Because people surround me, I don't know who that meant. Security couldn't handle that. So I spoke to them, I said, I tried to explain that this is not, this is not true. This is what is happening in the party, blah, blah, blah. And this, blah, and so I, 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 I told them. During the course of that meeting, brother, you all can't grumble, you all can't comment. When, I, when, when the people were listening, they're talking at the same time. They, they responded to some of the points I make at the same time. So I had to keep them quiet. So every time they, 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 I speak and and, 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 and if you have to respond, I had to put my hand in the air for them to go quiet. And they did so, you know, like when the soca, the soca artist giving instructions on, on a stage, it was a similar thing before we knew. <laughs> when, when I spoke and the people were, were not, Buying the point, they were not buying my point because they all they wanted to say, Where is Morris? We want to see him. We elected him. We want to see him. We don't want to see Bernard Gold. See for code, see for communism. All can, all can I, 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 I point me. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to be spending all those points in that hostile crowd. That hostile crowd, that is the kind of thing I went through, you know. So when I listen to people like Deborah talking, I'm kind of thinking nonsense, and so I had to laugh. Because I've been in the thick of things, risking my life to try and save the revolution and see the thing. So when I when I um this thing went on for a while, stop, start, stop, start. I I I I quite agree this this stop. And this is this is because of the relationship and the with the people over the years. So I understand the reason. And when I was about to go, my security detail managed to reverse my car up into the middle of the crowd, just to open the back door. I'm going to come out here. I'm going to get in. That's how the situation was. Because people, they, 
One guy came and said, Strong, what happened, man? What happened? What, what going on? What are you doing, man? What are you doing? All the mass of the revolution. I said, Nathaniel, brother, Nathaniel. And interestingly, let me make this point. Interestingly, one of the women who has, atta has been attacking us for, for years and years, you know, when we're in the and continue to do so today. You want a Peggy Nessie? Mm -hmm. Peggy Nessie. On that day, you know, could you imagine on that day? Yeah. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, sure. Sure. On that day, when I was about to go and, and, and disappointed her favor, you know, I could do, I could I could leave that out of it. But she came up to the car and decided to stand up to prevent the people from attempting anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That 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 Peggy Nestle did that, you know. Peggy Nestle wouldn't talk to me now, even if she passed and said she never talked to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. she, she would have seen as helping to save my life on that particular day. Okay. The Amen. final point I wish you to answer before we move on to um to Adele is uh, did Bernard fully resign from his government position, i.e. Minister of Finance and Minister of Trade, and also from all aspects of the mutual movement? And was he planning to leave the island after the, or during the detainment of Marx Fisher? Yeah, he was planning to, to, plan to leave the country. No, did he resign his? He resigned. On the 14th. Resigned what? His ministerial position. So he resigned from government? Yeah. Could that not be? No, he resigned one week before the mass resignation of white man, Ram Dani, Bain, George Louisan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Could that be seen as a ruse to undermine the authority of Morris Fisher? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that should not be thought of at the time. He probably thought that resigning would have to quit the right. Because, and listen to how his resignation came out. Eh? Listen to how his resignation came out. I went down to the market square because I was told that people are gathering and they need somebody to go and speak to them. So I, the suggestion was that I should go and talk to them. I went down to the capital in front of the free West Indian. As usual, and that was long before the 18th, you know, when I went to the Julia. The 14th, two days after the rumor. By the time I get there, people started to gather, as usual. People started to gather. So my task was to explain to the people I know they heard, they heard the rumor, but I, I was going to give them the truth. That is not my, that is not so. A, a party matter has developed. And this is the route we take in. It's unbelievable. Well, well, when, I, when, so, I, so. When, I, when I got back to Montreal a few hours later, Bernard resigned because by then, Alistair Hughes sent a report out to Canada, out to the region, claiming that I said that Maurice Bishop has been removed and he was replaced by Bernard Gould. Can you imagine that? <laughs> So I had to put out a statement right away denouncing Alistair Hughes and his strippiness and so on. Alistair Hughes was a major journalist. Yeah. A well-respected journalist among us. Respected journalist, but what he was, in, he was finding the film because rumors, he didn't want his rumors to stay long at all. He was finding the film. And his task was to keep his masters informed as to what had been happening and the revolution is moving down the drain. That, that is the objective. You say the revolution was moving down the drain? No, he didn't say that. He assesses that mm -hmm. there's opportunity to, to crush the revolution. So every negative point should be sent out now. And that is why he did it. Mm -hmm. But I denounced that point the same day it came out. The same day it came out. Mm -hmm. And so on. And it was, it, was, it was a few hours later after that report by Alistair Hughes, which went out to the region, that Bernard could resign mm -hmm. on his steep position in his finance and economic planning and so on. But he didn't resign from a party as such. Okay. He didn't resign from a party. 
Can I uh, move on to the next question? Um, Del, are you able with your question? Then Goddard, I'll come to you if uh, and when Del speaks. Uh, well, so I can you please, my train you please keep it brief. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought because I wanted to help out Salo on something, but I wanted to address, um, I think it was Deborah. Deborah repeat, repeated total CIA and US propaganda. And I know she probably means well, and it's probably coming from a good place and she is still hurting like many other, many Grenadians. But um, the idea that in 2018, that she would have gone to Grenada and spoken to ex-security forces in the PRA or personal security is totally 100% fictional. It didn't happen because none of the people in the security forces would have been in the know working that industry right now has been associated with it. So whoever she spoke to, she was just getting, you know, tw information from 12 degrees of separation. So I wish that um, she would have come here with an open mind and um, yeah. and, and, and tried to learn. Listen, I, I, I'm still mad. I, I'm still not happy <laughs> with the explanation that Comrade Cello has given me here today. Um, he was known for his fiery uh, eloquence. I'm not seeing that. I guess age has slowed all of us, all of us down. But um, I wanted you to clarify something that I'm a little bit unhappy about that you said. When you talk about the security forces determine, uh, read a rumor that was, um, that was spread. And that was real. And listen, that rumor was not new. That rumor was previously spare, spread by people who were attempting to destabilize the, the revolution in its very early stages. And it was not coming, it was not originated in Grenada. That was clearly CIA propaganda to, to yeah. create distrust among the people. So when that rumor was repeated at that by, by that time, it, you could almost say that that rumor was sort of planted in Morris' head way back when, you know? And I'm gonna say something that's probably uncomfortable here, all right, for a lot of people. And I'm a great admirer of Morris. And I'm, I'm, I had the opportunity to introduce him on three occasions at public rallies and at regional functions, all right? So great admirer, love the man, love the leadership, but could some of the decisions that Morris made himself contributed to his own debt. Could you explain? And it's, it's difficult, it's uncomfortable to blame somebody who was killed or who was murdered or assassinated, however you want to put it for them. But this didn't happen just from one side. And the final thing I would say, Cello, is that leading up to the, to the 19th, and in particular on that day, were you for yourself fearful because when we when we we're making decisions in fear, when we are operating in fear, we think first and foremost about self-preservation. So how much of that played into how everything unfolded? Because the leadership of the security forces in Grenada at the time were all members of the Central Committee, so they were one of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Before hey, you just if, Brian. okay, before you answer, just to make a point. Um, we were due to finish at nine o'clock, but like last week's meeting, we may continue. I'm going to close the meeting at 9.30. So any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, some people are saying you're a total liar in the chat, and I think you should know that. Other people are saying that you appear to have won them around. Um, what we are saying is we operate on facts. We operate on written statements, statements that have been given. The emotion is high. A number of us have been involved in this thing since, well, in your case, since the, uh, since the 1970s. In my case, from 1974, at least. And it still hurts. It's, it hurts when I see what Grenada was achieving. Mm -hmm. International airport, reduction in unemployment, our students going across the world to study. It, it, it just hurts how, how the thing was mashed up. So like... Uh, Brother Baptiste, I, 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 I. Anyhow, Goddard, <laughs> sorry to keep you, 
so long. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's a question. Yeah, it's a question. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, before we come to you, Goddard, um, decisions of Morris. Do you believe that some of those decisions contributed to his demise? And what were those decisions? And then were you fearful at the time when he made decisions? Could you please be brief? <laughs> yeah, no. okay. Actually, the thought never crossed my mind in any serious way. Maybe because, <laughs> because of a kind of self-confidence I have, I feel that in spite of the nature, the dangerous nature of this rumor, there is some way that I, be, I believe in the masses. I believe in the masses. I know I always hold a position that I know that Morris is deeply loved by people. Delbert has made a point. And I could see, I could see that even though, yeah, even though um, he might be upset with somebody's decision and so on, but he still loves Morris like, like, like lots of people, lots of people. I have, I have encouraged Morris to do a number of things in terms of keeping food to the party over the years. I said, Morris, the masses love you, it's true, but do not forsake the party, find a way to, to meet to them on a regular basis. Because we are friends, we are, we are complete friends in many respects. So while, um, well, I understand the point that everybody's making, but I didn't feel for me. I didn't truly, the, the truth, earnest truth of the matter, I didn't feel that in me in those people. Right? I feel that I had the ability to help solve my problem. And my way to do that is to reach out to the masses. That's why people were relying on me. If you want somebody to go and face the people, I, they call, they, they, they call on me. And that's the belief I had. And probably that's what saved me because I don't know, sometimes when I looked up, oh my God, how come, how come? The people are so outside and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not speaking against Morris, but I'm trying to reason and say, listen, I know you feel, but this is what I, these are the facts. I have to give you the facts. I cannot in fact say otherwise. And this is nothing against Morris. It's nothing against Bernard. And I don't know why are the, why are the cousin Bernard and carrying on. See for communism, see for food. When I arrived in, in for example, when I arrived in Juilliard, I was confronted with a placard. You know, I won't, I won't repeat the word here. But something else, you know, two words, you know. Any other person would have just jumped in the car and run back, you know. Was one of those words called? Yeah, mm -hmm. had to be. Okay. <laughs> So with that kind of situation, I was faced with that. Maybe, maybe it's naivety on my part or what, but the fear that you refer to, Delbert, is a reasonable point. But it never occurred to me that I would have been slaughtered by the masses. Okay, thank you. It never occurred to me that I... Okay, thank you. I'll move on now to Goddard. Goddard, please unmute yourself. Thank you uh, for taking the question. Mr. Strawn, thank you for, um, for coming and speak to us uh, this week. Um, the question that I had was that um, earlier in the conversation, it seemed like you became very emotional when you were speaking about your relationship with um, Morris. Uh, for the younger ones like me, um, could you elaborate on that relationship a little bit? I, I found that very interesting. And would you ever consider writing a book or a memoir about all the things that you're speaking to us about today. Thank you very much for your question. I have considered that and I've been urged by different people all over the place to come with my book. It's time for you to write your book, everybody writing and so on. So I have taken the decision, the decision to do so. I have material and eventually I'll put something together. But Morris and I had a special relationship, and that's why I always get emotional when I talk about this. You know? Because I never, I never anticipated this thing happening to us. I remember how we used to struggle, the sacrifices we made. Look, take an example. In the latter part of 1978, I remember we went to Karaku to campaign. And from Karaku, we went to Pity Martin. The four of us, me, Morris, 
Bernard Uni. We went over to Karaku. Karaku for the unknown. Karaku and then Piti Martinique. These are the islands that, that form part of Grenada. Part, part of the city of Grenada. And we couldn't come back during the night. We had to go to an old school, an old abandoned school. Bush going in and so on, and there's a, 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 a narrow bench there. A narrow bench there that remained from us. The three of us, the four of us tried to crump up on that bench to sleep over the night. These are the kind of things we used to do in terms of struggling for the people. So there's no question that what happened when, when, when the revolution came, we were going to be bringing that energy and fervor to get things moving, and we did, and we did. We did. There's no question about that. So when this thing happened, and we discussed it, because I, I, I want to say that I voted for joint leadership, and Moses was my friend. I voted for joint leadership, and he was my friend. Because I was clear that joint leadership would not affect him. And he would be able to carry out his function even better as prime minister, commander chief of the armed forces, and the leader of the revolution. I was convinced of that. Maybe I was idealistic at the time. But then when he came back and he told me I changed his mind, me and he sitting in the back of his car, I said, wow, this is. This requires some discussion. And I said, I can't, I understand your position. But you need to bring them back to the body and first make a decision. She agreed to right away. And I agreed to mobilize the Central Committee and we meet. So what happened between when I came back from, from, from the airport with him and what happened on the 12th? I don't know. Other people most have moved around the country, other people. But I'm in fact influenced him further, further to join the I don't, I don't have the fact. But knowing him, as I do, he like to listen to people. And he tend, he tend to go backward and forward, depending on who spoke to him last and so on. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a possibility. Okay. It's a real possibility. All right, thanks. Um, John Kelly. Oh, by the way, by the way, I should make this point. Very important point in my view. When Morris came back, he was going around the country. One of the first things I only discovered afterwards, you know, after after the thing. One of the persons home he went to was like I'm Daniel. I marveled because Lightning and Daniel came to see me after that happened. He never mentioned once that Morris was at his home. Never once. Mm -hmm. That's one of the people. Because he was moving around the country that David says the first when he came back. I went to meet him the, 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 on the 12th, on the 8th, sorry, the 8th. So between the 8th and the 12th, he was going to the place and so on. And one of the place, places he went to during that period before the rumor was spread was Leiden Ramdani home. I discovered that afterwards. I didn't know that at the time. And, and what is more striking is that Leiden Ramdani came to a meeting with me on the 18th of October. At that time, he met with Morris already. And I didn't know that at the time. He never told me that. I was talking again. That, that, is, that is the thing that, all the different things that went on that people don't know about and so forth. Okay. The different players. Okay. Um, John, John Calist. Uh, John Calist is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the panelists, along with Alan Scott and uh, Comrade Selwyn. John. Um, you uh, raised your hand, and I promised to come back to you. Uh, do you wish to continue speaking? John? Hello? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, good night again, folks. I um... Please introduce yourself fully. John. Okay. My name is John Kelly, the owner and publisher of Genesis Magazine and um, of JFM Radio in Toronto. I have been a former personal security to Bernard at, and the leadership of, of um, the Great Revolution at the age of 16. I joined in turning 17 at that year. 
uh, in November that year, I um I been I work with Cello on numerous occasions. Uh, I would say very fine brother to work with, um, Bernard and Morris. However, um, a, a number of stuff I've been reading a number of comments in the in the chat, and one of which was I'm gonna deal with this one. And and did an excellent job and explain himself a number of things. And again, as security, we had a lot of information that was not probably released to them, um, and uh, even above my pay grade. And there are certain things I know within my period what I should have known for operational purposes. Um, one of the one of the things I want to talk first about is the meeting Morris at the airport and uh, why several alone went. He could disagree with me if we have any other information on that. But we was told of uh, of the angular situation that was going around within the the, the security forces uh, in discussion with the Cuban and so on. Um, so for that reason, the security forces decided not to allow Bernard to go to the airport of what may be happening there, based on the Angola situation that um, many people may not be aware of, um, where the Cuban forces executed um, other members of the opposing party or the members of the party in Angola. And after that, they put uh, install a government of the choice. Um, from that basis, we decided not to take Bernard to the airport of the event, what may unfold, not knowing what's going to happen because no questions, questions was asked by the Cubans was not answered uh, by, by the security forces. However, um, in relation to the question of St. Paul and Errol George, that I um, I was summoned to a meeting um, in the security, personal security headquarters uh, where the letter from St. Paul, from um, Errol George was read out um, to the, to the unit, the entire unit that was present at the time. And um, the detail of what discussed, was discussed in the office, in the room with Maurice St. Paul and Errol George. Fast forward to October 19th, I personally asked St. Paul, um, who was sitting on a box of ammunition. There was no authority given to me to ask him these questions. I went over to him, myself, Ricky Paul, Leslie Sinse, and Dwight Jeremiah, and ask him what about this rumor that you and Maurice and Semple was um, and, and Errol George was doing? He said, "Boy, the chief, the chief f up, you know, chief make us do this and stuff like that." I regret the, the, that happening. Um, so then the the event started unfolding on foot report, and we all rushed to the fence to see what happening. Um, a lot of people not not speaking of that, but I've had different shows here and different account of persons who was on the food and saw different things happening. Um, I want to say this one thing. The, the morning of, and I heard the question asked in the chat here, why wasn't the security um, protecting Morris? Well, Morris was protected, but you have a nation overrunning your security was limited in the, in, in the yard at the time. There was no way. The, the two sentries at the door, there was knocked down. All right, they were bust the gate in, they went in. Even though there was armored vehicle, armored vehicle in, in, in the yard, I will speak to that in a while. Um, they went in and um, I said, look, correctly stated that gunshot was fired in the air, hoping that they, 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 they will disperse. That didn't happen. They went in, they took Morris and they went away with Morris. All right, um, the armored vehicle in the yard, Tari rolled out and Morris was walking by it and he said, don't fire on the masses. I remember that clearly. Right, and Maurice walk out to do with, it, with the crowd that morning. Um, they got down the street, and um, and I want to refresh Cello memory of his one of his personal security. Bonner James came back up. He was down in the bottom with, with the crowd with Uni, and they asked to go to PS to take the ammunition from there to arm themselves. We immediately went on the order of at um on the morning to take the the most air bus and take all the ammunition from there and bring it to region one. We did that. We returned and then we were ordered to take Bernard into safety, which we took him to Fort Frederick for his safety. Um, we did that. Um, while he was on, I'm going back to Fort Frederick, um, we there and I got a phone call before the this before all the the so the, the 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 communication was cut. I got a phone call from Fort Rupert from Comrade Dasset Peters, who said to me that there are many the masses here and some, some of the guys have been arrested. Just then, Eunice Whiteman walked in, took the phone from him, and I knew that because he spoke to me. 
And he asked, who it is? I said, come back, Callis. He said, come back, Callis. I want all of you to surrender to the nearest police station officer guy's death. I said, excuse me. He said, I'm doing your fever. All of you up there should re re um, surrender officer guy's death. I immediately went to Roderick S. James, who was my commanding officer of the unit. I told him exactly what I was told. Then Comrade Lane went on to speak to, to Uni, who told him the same thing that he told me. And whatever transpired from there, the dispatch, and Comrade Lane took um, command of the unit uh, the, as a commanding officer of the Army that day on there. He had called a, a meeting, all soldiers on the floor that morning and declare that from this day on, he is now a commanding officer. So that was happened, that happened there. Um, the, the question that was raised, someone raised something here that, um, he said, but some, somebody said something, I wanted to address it. Um, oh my goodness, I think he moved up too far. Shocks. I think it was Brother Lloyd, somebody. I can't, but I can't trace the question right now. But someone made a, a point that Cello and everybody knew that they wanted to kill Moise before, um, beforehand. Well, I, 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 I beg to defer on some of these this notions that it was a planned killing and they wanted to get more of Morris um, long before. I, I do not buy into that narrative. Again, like Delbert said, it, it's always been orchestrated. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that was always planted way before the, the October 83. And I, I said it here last week that the rumor didn't just start it in October 83. Um, from my recollection, and I went to prison at Tobona that I didn't like him because of the rumor that I heard about him. And when I began working with Bernard, I realized that it's a different person they're talking about. It's not the same person. So I had I had my doubts. And when I started working, I realized here's a man that is putting a lot of stuff into the revolution and trying to make it work the way best he can for the overall good of gradient. And there is a rumor about him that is not lining up with his work ethics. So I wanted, I always wanted to make that point. However, um, as a security, we have we have made certain decisions, um, some above my pay grade. And again, as a security, you are responsible to protect the minister at all time. And that was done, you know, to be protect every minister was that was under our charge. So we did that well, and I, I have no um, regret for protecting and serving the leadership of my country at that time. So I just want to, to just plug that in there. Okay. Th thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Kellys. You've spoken, um, you too probably should write your own story because you've given a lot of detail. Um, I'm going to close the meeting now because we've gone over the time that we've said. A number of people have left saying that they are, some are hungry, some are tired. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask uh, Comrade Cord if you could, Comrade, Selwyn. Selwyn. <laughs> People say we're biased. Uh, Comrade Selwyn, if you could um, close the meeting and um, I will sum up. Yeah. Well, let me thank you all for coming tonight to discuss this matter. It is sad that we do not have the revolution anymore. Very, very sad. And I share your sadness. But as we close, I want to say that we all made a profound contribution to the development of this country. And the result of our work will live on forever. No question about that. The revolution would not die completely. It may not resurrect in our lifetime, but because of what we did, generations to come will appreciate it and take things from there. I do hope and pray that as the educational work continues, people will get to know more and more and have a better appreciation as to what happened during that very important period. 
Do not be afraid to share your views. Do not be afraid to express yourself. Speak to anybody. State your opinion. You might be wrong, you might be right. Engage in discussion. And try to analyze and come to the right conclusion. Someday we'll understand much better what happened. We are sorry that Maurice Bishop is not with us. We are sorry that the rest of the leadership is not with us. We are sorry that we've had all had to spend years and years in prison before we can come out and have a chat with you. I want to say here tonight that the events of October 19th would go on in our memory for, 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 for a long time to come. That we talk about it every year. That's unexpected. But justice is yet to be done. We have had a kangaroo trial. People are so anxious to get rid of the rest of the leadership and they forget everything about rule of law and so on. This is very sad. And that is why I said to you at the beginning that I have a huge moral responsibility for what happened. But I want to say that I'm not legally responsible. And I have decided to take the matter further. I have decided that I'm going to petition the, the, the Governor General to have our matter further litigated in the court. I believe we do have a case to complete. And the judgment of the Privy Council in 2006 has provided us with a basis for trying to get our matter fully resolved. And I'll be taking the matter to the court, but to the Governor General in the first place to see what, what is possible. But I'm not going to rest until justice is done. I'm not going to rest. Okay. So stay tuned for that. And thank you again for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, repeat and um, amplify our thanks to all of you, all of you who attended tonight, all of you, including those who, whose comments may have been felt to be hostile. You could have been doing something else, but you gave us the uh, courtesy of attending this meeting and speaking to us. Do not take our response as any sign of hostility. We really would like to just explain um, would like to tell you these are the facts as we know them. Here is the evidence. So in summation, um, this is what I have to say. There hopefully will be a recording of this meeting on the website of Grenada for whatever, and it's Grenada for whatever net. Um, please add yourself to our mailing list. Uh, look on the website. You'll see an opportunity to add yourself on the mailing list so that future meetings uh, you'll be informed of. The documents requested by participants, we will circulate them to participants, and if so, also put them on the website. So if you haven't put your details, put your details down on the chat, along with the documents that you wish to see. Um, they don't have to be specific. It could be, you know, tell us about X, Y, and Z, or tell us about A, B, and C. We've had a very, very interesting evening with a founder member of the New Jewel Movement, which led the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada, which in a radio interview from Grenada that I heard today, the government of today were criticized for not carrying out some of the programs that were successfully carried out yeah. by the government led by Maurice Bishop. Can you imagine that? Yep. Things that we did 
40 something years ago. And I know because I was involved in a tiny bit of it. The government of Grenada hasn't got the capacity to do today. That interview, I hope it's by Calistra Farrier with the Minister of Culture and Youth. I hope we can put on our website. It will give you an explanation of where things are and so on in relation to Grenada's history. I hope we've given you some answers. I hope we've given you answers from the facts that we have presented to you. Um, we hope to have follow-up meetings from this one, but there is a danger in that, which is that we'll end up speaking just about October the 19th. There were 40 separate government entities that were created in Grenada to foster and strengthen Grenada's economy, foster and strengthen the workers, the poor workers of Grenada. That's why I got involved. That's why you got involved. The people who are poor as a result of the hundreds of years of kidnapping and enslavement in our country. There will be a follow-up meeting stating not just what happened in October, but more importantly, the lessons that we've learned about how these people during those four short years could achieve so much. I mean, how many people were there in Grenada? A million or something? <laughs> 100,000. Um, you know, I, 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 I lived in Britain and, I, and my mind boggles. Where the hell did these people find time to do all of this stuff? Army, militia, youth wing, women's organization, build the airport, uh, set up a stone crushing plant, set up a, the Sandino plant. Um, I, for example, was responsible for selling some of the agro-industrial products from Grenada. Uh, it, 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 it's mind-boggling. And this was done <laughs> without any money. When Morris Bishop, on the morning of the revolution, said, this is what we're going to do, it had already been planned out. It wasn't something that was scribbled on the morning of the paper, at the, uh, on some paper in the morning uh, at Radio Free Grenada. This was all planned out years before. And people asked him, where, what, where are we going to get the money? He said, no, 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 we're not going to wait for the money. We're going to do it now. And it was done. And then the money came. So there'll be follow-up meetings on the successes of the revolution. Now, yeah. I've been asked to say, <laughs> thank you, Delbert. I've been asked to say, and I've put it in the chat, does anyone disagree with the statements that we have issued? I don't want to go too long, but if you come up a little bit in the chat, it's calling upon the government of Grenada to establish a judicial inquiry to determine the facts, not the opinion, the facts of what happened, to support the government of Grenada in its effort to determine the whereabouts of the remains of Maurice Bishop and those who fell with him, and to congratulate the government of Grenada on its intention to mark the 19th of October as a public holiday, just to say something about the finding the remains of Morris. We, Grenada for whatever, along with individuals in Grenada, along with GEMFM in Canada, and along with numerous other groups here in Britain, have been arguing for several years that the government of the United States, which had judicial and factual control of Grenada, had a responsibility to hand over the remains of Morris Bishop to family and relatives. Now, some people will say, well, you guys killed him. So it's nothing to do with the United States. Yes, Morris Bishop was killed by members of the army and was buried at Camp Fedon, that we know. But when the Americans invaded, they took over Grenada and Morris's Bishop, Mor and Morris Bishop's body was disinterred by the United States um, bodies recovery unit. They've got a special team that returns bodies, digs up bodies, return them to family and so on. There is photographic evidence and there's evidence from members of the Jamaican Armed Forces who accompanied the Americans to the remains of Morris. The remains of Morris was last in the possession of the American government. And we've been arguing for years that they should be released. The bodies should be released. So, those are some of the things we've said in the resolution of the, from this meeting. If there's anyone who objects to what we're saying, um, I would ask them to make a note in the chat, um, but I, I, will, I will press on. Um, we will disseminate 
information on the Revo, and we will do so uh, in our meetings, in our events, and on our website. So please, please watch. I will take responsibility as secretary of Grenada for whatever to send the three messages to um, the government of Grenada, to the particular minister who was on the radio today, and to the prime minister, Mr. Deacon, Honorable Deacon Mitchell. And we will inform you of the results of this correspondence. So thank you very, very much for this, um, Selwyn, and thank you again all of you for staying so long with us. In closing, Thank you. finally, finally, do you have anything to say? Thank you very much. Long live the memory of the Grenada Revolution. Long live. Or whatever. Back with never. Back with never. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ezra died. Any Jewish person is not associated with the all that is done on us for our even though Okay. Thank you all very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right, John. All right, comrade son, seven so hope we connect sometime later. Um, those of you, those of you who are interested, we'll be having a show tonight at 8 30. They're about to be here co-hosting me. Um, Margaret Francis will be doing a little follow-up discussion on this show. So um we'll be having a talk back on Gem FM tonight Margaret at 8 30. Yes, Margaret Francis. Yes, she's there, she's listening. <laughs> Give her my best regards, man. Well, she's right there. I'm sure she could answer that. Yeah. <laughs> I heard from Margaret in the years, man. Uh, before you yeah, do, yeah. I can clear the meeting open. I'll keep the... I'll keep... <laughs> sorry, I declare the meeting closed. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. I declare the meeting... Closed, closed. yeah. Closed. But I will keep Zoom open. <laughs> People want yeah. to have chats and so on. Please. Yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will... Hi, Kenny. Hi, Kenny. Um, Lincoln Deputy, uh, Lincoln Deputy is also watching Cello. So, um, Lincoln, if you if you're available tonight, you could join us tonight on the on the panel as we continue to discuss the, the talk back after the show. So, we, we are back here tonight at um, eight thirty on Gem FM Radio. So, um, that's Canadian. Join us. That's Canadian time. What? That's what? yeah, Canadian, 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 Canadian time. Yes. What yeah. district of Canada? Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Toronto. Toronto time. So yeah, eight thirty. Okay. All right, give all, my, all the comrades up there my, my best regards, man. Yeah. All right. So, one of the revolutionary greetings to them all. Cello, they ought to know that the revolution was never afraid of protest. protest. I remember I, I, within months of the revolution, I think it was, I let John would remember that too. We led a student um, demonstration to your offices for better school buses, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. I was first vice president of the National Student Council. John was responsible for the Eastern Zone. And we, our students were demanding because the revolution, one of the things the revolution had done was promise people so many things. And they were delivering at such a rapid pace. Mm. And the students came to us and said, listen, we want better school buses. You guys say you are our leaders. Then you need to it take was, us to meet Comrade Strong. And I don't know if you remember that meeting. So we yeah. had to organize a delegation and come to your office. And it was so <laughs> that you told us I that you guys that, already have plans for National Transportation mm -hmm. Service. And, and soon after that, when it came, students were riding for 25 cents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were always. I also remember. I also Dan remember when Jimmy was struggling. Eh, eh. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Nurse. This I, nurse, Doctor Nurse. I love. How are you doing, Cameron? I love. I love seven solo ministry. Yeah. I love. I love your ministry on a study leave in 1981. Yeah. It's on the study geology and I'm studying Yes. Yeah, study geology. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, Brother so, Nurse, so, you just so, repeat so, what so you said? So time for the mobilization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
Nice to see you all, man. Long live coming. Long live, long live. One love, one love. Mm -hmm. in Canada now? No, he's still, yeah, he's still, still in GDR. I'm in GDR still. I'm still in East Germany. East of Germany. <laughs> the same spot I came here. I still call it East Germany after the annexation <laughs> of the West. That's right. No. We were annexed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's having its repercussion right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, comrades. Nice. Yes, man. comrades. Long live. Long live, man. But yes. Yes. Um, I agree that the next forum really has to address the successes of the revolution. You know, every October, I spend almost the entire month of October um, defending uh, the <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, have, I was involved this morning in an, an hour-long debate on, on, on Facebook with a good friend of mine who was detained during the revolution. And um, we're, we're, we're good friends. And um, I make no apology. I told him that he deserved back then to be detained, you know? Um, you, couldn't <laughs> let, you couldn't let a minority upset um, stand in the way of progress for the majority. So, yeah. um, but you know, there were mistakes made and, and we have to acknowledge it. And, um, but we need to talk about the successes because there were many. You know, many, many yes, things yes. that the revolution did did so very well. I don't know if Stella remember that one. Um, one of the um, uh, slogans we had very early was "putting people first, You know, yeah. that in 1992, that was the slogan of the Bill Clinton um, um, presidential campaign. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I always, I always <laughs> because mm, right, that's right, that's all right. these evil things, but they were copying our slogans from, from 20, 25 years previously. So <laughs> they we, learned, need they learned. About, we need to talk about the successes. And, and actually, in my recent travels to Grenada, so many young people, so many young people are asking about that period. Mm -hmm. So we, we, need, we need to have... Um, education, have education. Yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I think at this point, more people are interested in what was successful than the failures now Absolutely. at this point. In, yeah. Um, I refuse, I personally refuse to have any conversation on my decision. Um, I, I, I seriously, I refuse anything that is, uh, and I told you, brother, that the same brother probably has spoken to that October Mod is, is, is uh, October Mod is not for him to come on to belt out what the ocean did to him, but a time to reflect on what happened during the ocean and that he, and that his particular personal story. So I would I would entertain another time, but if we have to be um, this medium is not to 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 talk about the, the, the negative about the Green Revolution. If we cannot promote the good thing about it, I have no problem discussing what went on during the revolution on both sides. But if you just want to come with a one-line story about what you you experience only and not be taking the holistic approach, I will not be entertaining it. Seriously. Yeah. You know, it's I think a, a, a holistic approach to the whole thing. Uh, what who takes responsibility for what? And I I, I make mention uh, I have pictures to prove 1980 in the bar in the park. These are the people that, that did that. So if you want to talk about you being tortured in the prison, then you hit a bomb that killed that killed two sisters, three sisters, three, three, two women, young women, leave one still walking with a with a cane or with a with a with a, with a, with a, with a thing. So your your justification, you know, show me your, your show me your wounds, I'll show you this. You know? Yeah. Okay, so, so if I can if I can just say this, um Grenada for whatever, and before Grenada for whatever, as well as now, Committee for Human Rights in Grenada. Yes. Um, we have been singing from the rooftops mm -hmm. the successes of the revolution. Mm -hmm. We've been singing. Now, maybe it's a very small rooftop. But <laughs> yeah. We are up against a country that has spent billions mm -hmm. and made tiny Grenada. Yeah. The only military victory that America has achieved since the Second World War. Can you imagine yeah. that? <laughs> mm -hmm. right? yes, and we yes. fought for several days against what's it? What's it? I think twelve hundred militia and army mm. fought against seven thousand United States forces. But well, hold on. And, and, and hold, hold, hold on. Let me correct that. No, no, no. Everybody, every, everybody <laughs> did not fight. 
no. <laughs> However, let's not dwell upon that aspect of it. Mm. We decided <laughs> to build an international airport before we had any money. Yeah. And people went and broke the ground before we had a, a dollar <laughs> of money coming in. Now, uh, yes, yes, the Cubans gave us a lot, but I was, I, I, I was responsible for ensuring the purchasing of British equipment. Plessy, Plessy uh, International British Company, um, did the air traffic control system under an export credit guarantee supported by the US government. A company from Houston in America, in Texas, did the dredging across the bay mm -hmm. over which mm -hmm. the airport runs. The Libyans contributed money. Grenadians raised the money themselves. These things are phenomenal from a country yeah. of 100,000 people. Comrade, I don't think you realize fully the import of what you guys did. It shows that a people mm. without resources, yeah. but having a clear idea of what they're going to do. Can mm. can uh, 44. I, I, I think you, one of the things that is important to note here also that the famed um, US Navy SEALs who were in Grenada during the illegal invasion of my country, because of the fierce, and that, that's their own word, there's a documentary on it, the fierce resistance they received from what they previously call an ill-equipped, ill-trained gang of um, misfits. That's how they describe the PRA, all right? When they invaded and the fierce fighting, especially the ones that happened in the Bush, Bush U area, mm -hmm. all right? It mm -hmm. resulted in the Navy SEALs changing the entire ops manual on how to fight because they said they learned tremendous from the, 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 the battle that went on at that place. So um, they don't want to tell that story that we were a heroic people and that our people defended our homeland and gave their lives and believed, believed in that process, you know? So even... I know following the 19th, when everybody was dejected that Morris was no longer there, the idea that some person is going to come and just take over my country just didn't sit well with me. And the other, the last thing I'm going to say is that the U.S. committed war crimes in Grenada, you know? Um, A lot of it. That, that's how Blondell Church ended up dying. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all kind of stuff that Blondell died from. Blondell died in my house when my house was shot up by an Apache helicopter. I was living in the character cottages at the time, Cello, and they, the, the along with, with the Cuban technocrats, the basketball coaches, the Spanish teachers, yeah. they, they, they believed that these people were soldiers. And without warning on the October 26th, about 5.30 that evening, they just came in and blew the cottages apart. Mm. And that's when Blondell died in my, my house. I managed to escape over and went over to Hibiscus Inn. And um, uh, Russell and Twine, who was chairman of uh, yeah, right, the right. corporation at the time, hid, yeah. hid, hid, hid me in, 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 in a refrigerator in the kitchen, you know? So, <laughs> so nobody don't come and tell me my story, man. We are heroic people. Yeah, yeah, drop your facts, man. Yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with you, man. I do drop. <laughs> Uh, Let oh, me ask you something. So, you had a brother who was in the Soviet Union? Yep. Yeah, Emery, Emery. Yeah. Where Emery. Is him? Where, is him? Where, is him? Where is him? He's in London. He's in London. Already. Oh, because they, yes. they, they don't follow the revolution, cut him there, I believe, you know. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I had just returned from, from, from SU with Tan coming, coming back and okay. um, had dropped, dropped off some supplies for him. Yeah. So, um, he lives in London now, yeah. He lives in London. Yeah. If you if you wish um, to Del, if you wish to uh, get send his details to me, I will. Uh, I will. Private chat. I'll pass it on to someone. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to say, hopefully, hopefully, in closing the unofficial part of the meeting, <laughs> if you look at how the United States tells its story, it always mentions the Cubans who fought. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were attacked. There is no mention of the Navy SEALs dropping their weapons and running back into the sea. Yes. A militia, a militia unit, a unit of farmers 
and labor and teachers. Yes, who came down by some beaten up old truck. Yes. What, had happened, what had happened, yes. folks, is that the seals have come in, you know, they're seals. They can walk yeah. 50 miles with a hundred pound backpack and so on. And they mm -hmm. resistance. Now, racism is a terrible thing. When you yeah. think people are stupid and ignorant, there yeah. is a narrative that the US is also selling, which is not only that it's only the Cubans that they fought, but somehow us people of African and Indian descent were chupidi. Yeah. <laughs> How could we organize a security, a personal security team? How could we train people to use anti-aircraft guns yeah. and shut down 10 of their helicopters? How is yes, that possible yeah. of such a poor mm. nation and so on? Yeah. Because they cannot take it. Yeah. They cannot, this is the equivalent of Mike Tyson saying, I just had a fight with a three month old child and I beat them. Yeah. They have never, they have never ever had any major celebration about their victory in Grenada. They what can't. They said is that they fought I, I, I mean, listen, they, they, for, for example, I remember when I was picked up, they blindfolded us, put us in a helicopter and flew us around, um, just from where we were picked up and knowing the area, they flew us down into the woodlands area in the back of Springs. We were blindfolded or kind of hanging outside of the helicopter. That suddenly you're up, up you, and they're firing weapons with the hope to get information. So we should tell them, uh, give information on on, um, on 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 the leadership, and we saw your name at this meeting, and and you know, um, Cello, you remember you remember she and Ross, she and Ross was. Paul Red yeah. Ralph Thomas, all that, that happened to, to, to us. So yeah, and, right, um, yeah. to this day, you know, we decided, listen, you guys are gonna have to kill us because we have nothing to share with you. You know. Us, man. It was a it was a it was a funny time. <laughs> yeah, I remember I remember they came and, for me, and, they came with two and, helicopters. And then, <laughs> and then and then when they could not get you to talk, then the psychological warfare began. I can't tell you how much pressure because I stayed in Grenada for about uh, another six months in my position. Um, even if they never invited me to meetings, so I, I would just show up in the ministry in the morning, and mm -hmm. and by nine o'clock I'm on Pandey Beach because they did not want me doing anything. They didn't want me involved in doing my job anymore, and um, they had a, 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 a first lieutenant who was in the psychological warfare unit, who I became his, his target. This guy would follow me every single place I went to Grenada just to hmm. intimidate me. Okay. And, and on one instance, where they visited my parents' house and told them that I had put their name on a list of people to be executed. These are the kind of things that they were doing to destabilize, to, to break us, basically, to break us, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, just, uh, I think this may be the last bit. Um, <laughs> LJ has, sorry, someone has asked if it's possible to buy a document or book that focuses on the successes of the Revo in detail. Uh, they are. There is a pamphlet. They also be a really good books written, yeah. Yes, there's a pamphlet which is on our website, which can be downloaded, called By Our Own Hands, um, written by uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Cushing and uh, Dennis Bartholomew, uh, which is me in a previous name. Um, it's a summary of some, of some of the successes of the revolution. Bernard Cord has written three books about four, the yeah. period. Four. 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 Uh, well, I've, I've missed the fourth, sorry. Yeah. About the successes of the revolution in detail. Explaining, for example, how we were attempted, uh, how the banking system was used in an attempt to close down the revolution with yeah. the various foreign banks suddenly deciding, you know, they're going to close and cause financial chaos in the place. However, that was defeated. So there's, there's books there. So, so just go on to Amazon if you can't get it locally. Um, just uh, check out Amazon, check out Bernard Cord, and uh, read the the books that he's written also sorry sorry um no, sorry i was just in also the revo economics 101 by bonnet code it's a document the people um by bonnet on the green revolution 
I have the copy of that. Anybody needs it, probably could forward it to them. I'll forward you that. Could you um could you please supply the details of its title? And if it's got an um a library number in the front, say the Library of Congress. There, there, the there's, a great, there's a there's a great <laughs> book by Chris Chris Searles also that that chronicles many successes of the revolution and Richard Hart, I think, who was the last attorney general. Yeah. Correct. Correct. There so there are mm -hmm. quite a bit of books. Um, I would say look on the website of Grenada for whatever, and also look on the website of an organization called Caribbean Labor Solidarity. And, 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 and the book, the book by Comrade Lane too, Tonight We Move. Move the uh, internet. Very gives, gives some great background into the making of the revolution um and and the early days of the revolution so there are good material out there and then listen we at G gem fm we always discuss the negro revolution you know, yeah, um, like i tell people i'm an unapologetic unabashed supporter and that's mm -hmm. um the one wow. constant not in my life outside of my daughter is the Grenada revolution you know? Delbert, and, um, yeah. can i can i ask a question sure i worked in the Grenada High Commission when the revolution collapsed. And for several years, I harbored an antipathy towards Bernard Cord. Not a, not a violent antipathy as expressed by some people. Fortunately, a number of people, you know, were patient with me and explained what it is mm. that I was experiencing, sort of trauma and disappointment. I have now come to respect Bernard Court. This does not mean that what we're doing is a whitewash about who is responsible and who is not. Yeah. But do you think it can be quantified the loss that Grenada has suffered by not utilizing the service of Bernard Court and the other leaders of the revolution who were incarcerated in prison and who are still ignored? You know, is, is it controversial to say that Grenada has suffered a great deal? Are you able to answer, Del? I'm think... sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. My, my question was, are you able to... I believe that Bernard Court could have contributed greatly to the people of Grenada after the formation of a government, albeit one under American control. Well, what I, loss, always... Sorry, what loss do you think Grenada has suffered by not utilizing his, his energy and intellect and those of you, the you, Grenada 17. Who you were must have heard me speak about that before because I have said that so many times. And um, here's an interesting fact. While I, I think that was still the, the, the interim government or maybe right after the first election. Under Blaise, Blaise, yeah. <laughs> while members of that new government were calling for Bernard's execution publicly in Grenada, at nights they were visiting him up at Richmond Hill Prison to tell them how to run the Ministry of Finance and how he was able to accomplish so much with so little in such a short space of time. So the idea, and, and I said it at last week's meeting, I have the unique position of having tremendous love and respect for both men, all right? And I, I, I had a little more information on how the situation unfolded than most people on the ground. But mm -hmm. I was angry. I was angry when the, when the revolution collapsed, you know? Um, and um, became very despondent. But I recognize now, and, and, and probably for a long time, how much we lost by, by not having him continue to contribute um, uh, to the nation's growth. And it is a failure on all successive leadership, what we call leadership in Grenada. For me, we have never had really good leadership since the revolution. I call them um, office holders. There's a difference between office holders and actually people who can lead and motivate you, like you said, to grow an economy four to six percent when the world was in recession. Mm -hmm. You um, know, and 
if 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 you had the opportunity to speak to Bernard now, which we have had several the, times, several times over the last year, two years or so, is that even though he has not been to Grenada in a while, he 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 understands Grenada, the economy, probably better than anybody else that I have spoken to in my life. And he said something to us uh, about a year and a half ago, or maybe a year ago, that his goal in Grenada was very simple. So that's why when people tell me about Bernard wanting to be prime minister and Bernard, it's nonsensical to me because Bernard's real goal in Grenada was to lift the standard of living of our people. This, this, is, this is what I heard him say in, in, in party meetings. I served on one or two committees that 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 um that he chaired or, or spoke to. Uh, I was disciplined by him. By him twice. This is not so <laughs> that, you know. I was brought before the OC, I think, two or three times. The third time, he pulled me aside, just pulled me aside, and sort of called me and said, "Knock it off, knock it off." Okay, this is your last warning. And it wasn't about my work. My work was always good, but it was about my own personal behavior. He just like he just looked me straight in the eye and said, "You know, I knew I know your parents. I know you come from a good family. Knock it off. This is your last warning." And you know, so this is somebody that um, I've been successful in managing in, in different enterprises in the U.S. and and for myself and for other companies. And so much of what I learned during the revolution, in terms of first taking responsibility for your action, in in holding myself and the people who work for me accountable, I learned during the revolution. I learned during the revolution. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am going to close now. <laughs> Right. You know you get you get. Uh, but, 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 but hold on, but hold on, hold on. Not, they're not. There's one thing I I I I I recall. Born in one of the shows that they they came to him asking how to save twenty five million dollars in in twenty four hours. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why he was in prison? They didn't, they didn't who, who know how to, to write a bond. They didn't know how to write a bond. <laughs> twenty five million dollars in twenty four hours in the prison, and the next morning they were still going and missing on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, before closing, um, uh, those of you who are still with us will be aware, those of you who are still with us will be aware that this, um, these two events were very male-centric, male-heavy. Yes. We had attempted to obtain mm. speakers from Grenada, uh, female speakers from Grenada um, and elsewhere and were unsuccessful. Uh, we approached about four prominent people who were involved in the revolution and um, they weren't wow. able they weren't able to um, to participate we hope to remedy this situation and we hope to do so at our future meetings we we are yeah. aware of men speaking to women and mansplaining so apologies thank you